rougher than the rest of them, the best of them, tougher than leather. You can call me Knuckles. Unlike Sonic, I don't chuckle. I'd rather flex my muscles. Welcome to NetLore, episode three. This time, it'll be hosted mostly by me, your your favorite host, Cybershell. And joining me, as always, is, of course, Bedhead Bernie. Yep. Should I call you Bedhead Bernie, or do you yeah. just want me to call you Bernie? You can just call me Bernie. I don't know. You can cut that part out then. <laughs> So last episode, I kind of took the reins for a story that I researched for. And this episode, it's Cybershell's turn. And he has prepared 13 pages of like notes. I, I'm, I may have gone a little overboard. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> this is like going to be fucking insane, but I'm excited. So this is about a man named Ken Penders. Do you know anything about Ken Penders? You mentioned that you like, you know who he is, yeah, but you I, don't know like the deep lore. Of course, you're not a big Sonic I'm not, dork I don't like know me. the deep lore. I just know that he had these ugly echidna characters or whatever. <laughs> and right. he was part of Archie not, Comics. Not inaccurate. And he like got kicked out. And also like that movie pitch, but I don't know if you're going to go into right, that Right, right, right. See, I honestly wasn't like such an expert on this, but I wanted to do a deep dive into it. Like I didn't want to just show off some ugly looking pictures and be like, look how weird this looks. And like, that's not like a substantial enough episode for a podcast. So I didn't even mean to, but I sort of accidentally ended up doing a little, just like entire look at his entire career or whatever. So why don't we, uh, why don't we start at the beginning? So who is Ken Penders? He's a uh, professional comic book artist and writer, best known for his work on the Sonic the Hedgehog series published by Archie Comics. He was born on September 29th, 1958, I think. Because even that, I'm not 100% not, sure like, about. confirmed? You don't he, know that? He, his, his date of birth is not listed on Wikipedia. So yeah, this is just kind of funny. How did you find that? <laughs> okay, so the Sonic Wiki has his birthday as September 29th. And CelebsAgeWiki.com says he was born on September 28th. And that also he was born in 1958. So whatever, it doesn't even matter. I'm just trying to give you a general idea that he's basically a boomer. He's like 60 years old. Just so you know, like oh, the time frame that he grew up during and whatnot. I just thought it was kind of funny how like the first fucking thing I went to put in the script, like this should be the easiest goddamn piece of info on anyone. I couldn't even find it right away. You know, uh, I don't want to sidetrack you too much, but are you going to go into like what other stuff he did in comics? Because I don't really know anything else he did other than the Archie comics. Yeah, again, I don't, I'm not going to do a, a super super deep dive into it, but I was going to just briefly touch on like before he worked on Sonic, he did some work on like Marvel and DC properties and stuff or was like Captain Adam and the Green Hornet and stuff like that. Oh, that's his art? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what his art when he was in like, I guess the 80s or whatever and working on just like... It's pretty good actually. Yeah, so this is the thing. I don't want to jump the gun here, but I'm going to get into this later, which is that he's, he's, he's not that bad at drawing like human characters and stuff. It's sort of just... We'll get into okay. it. The, uh, the other main... I would say the main thing he's known for besides the the Sonic comics within the industry, I mean, was he did a lot of work on some Star Trek comics. He's an artist and a writer. So sometimes he would get hired just to do art. And sometimes he get hired to write and sometimes both. But, so uh, like before Sonic, he was just like another comic artist. Exactly. He was just another licensed comic artist guy and uh, nothing too fancy. Although this is an interesting, I, this blew my mind. I had no idea about this, but uh, he actually had worked on a comic adaptation of a video game before he did there's like a zelda comic in the 80s he contributed one story to one issue but like he still did it like he posted these uh was he like a video game fan oh no so okay i can get into this so how did he get his job on archie so in 1993 the editor for the sonic comic at archie learns that the book's first writer might be leaving so he approaches a guy called mike kantorovich and asks him if he wants to work on it but Mike wasn't familiar with Sonic, so he contacted Ken Penders because he knew Penders' son was a Sonic fan, apparently. And that's how Ken got his job, due to a collaboration with this Mike guy. And uh, eventually, he debuted a story in the 11th issue of Sonic the Hedgehog. Let me briefly explain the Sonic comic, if you aren't familiar with this. So, the setting of the Sonic comic is based on what the old Saturday morning AM cartoon, which was like Sonic and his freedom fighter pals fighting against Robotnik. It takes place on a planet called Mobius, which is sort of just a weird thing made by like the Western canon of Sonic, if that makes any sense. Like that wasn't part of the Japanese lore, but it eventually became part of like, it, it permeated its way into the comics and stuff. Interestingly, the setting was sort of based on that cartoon, but the tone of the comic was much more in line with like the other cartoon, which was called Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, there were two Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons running at the same time, if you didn't know. So wait, so it, was it more lighthearted or was it more serious? It was very lighthearted and, and silly. There wasn't, there's not much to go on with Sonic as like the games. Like there's not a lot of source material to sink your teeth into. So they had to like make up a bunch of stuff. You know, there's the comic does have a bunch of OCs and stuff, which sometimes people make fun of, but like they really didn't have a choice especially back in these old days to just make, make stuff up like that. 
Was Sally invented for the comic, like Sally Acorn? She See, Sally and the Freedom Fighters, they were made for Saturday morning. Sad AM. It's called Sad AM. That's why I keep calling it that, yes. So they were created for that. So they are technically like, that was a pre-existing thing, although that show would only run for like two seasons and then end, whereas this comic would go for years. I mean, years. Like this ran for 290 issues on a monthly schedule. So What what year did it end? I'll, I'll get into this later. I'll get into this later. But it did because it ended and had a reboot. Okay. It lasted longer than you would expect as like a 90s property. Way longer. It was actually the longest running comic based on like a piece of media that was never rebooted at any point. Because like comics like, you know, Superman and stuff, those will be going on for a long time, but they like get rebooted all the time. Yeah, there's different versions. I'm not a big comic expert or whatever, but... Oh, wait, so it was like a single storyline? Yeah, it would start out extremely campy and silly, but over the years, lore would accumulate and then eventually like it would start to become a little bit more serious and melodramatic. Let me just get this clear. Like, it's worth emphasizing that the Sonic comic was worked on by, like, a bunch of different artists and writers. Like, it wasn't just Penders doing everything like that or whatever. And although he would end up contributing quite a lot over his years on the comic, it's not like he did a majority of it or anything. It It was a collaborative effort. It's just that Ken got on pretty early, and he was one of the first guys to start laying down, like, the foundations of lore. So, like, a lot of his characters and concepts became integral parts of the comic. So he undeniably played a pretty significant role in shaping it. So Ken was like right there at the beginning when it started shifting towards more serious stuff. Yes, exactly. Like the uh, first 10 issues are full on silliness. And then it's still silly for a good while after that. But they begin introducing more like storylines and stuff that would come up again. Other writers would eventually begin contributing more, but like I, I do feel Penders was one of the first guys to start. Credit where it's due, right? Yes, exactly. And yeah, I, I, so I was going to actually even say cards on the table. You know, I, I, I read the comic as a very dumb little kid with little to no critical analysis abilities whatsoever. So I really did enjoy some of the stuff he wrote for the comic. I don't want to be like just full hater mode or whatever the whole time. Like I actually enjoyed the end game arc, which was like issues 47 to 50. Ken Penders joins Archie after his son is used as a point of reference for why he should work on it. So what happens next? Like, what's his first contribution? Right, right. Um, Yeah, so in addition to, like, laying down the sediment of lore that would be built upon, he eventually would, like, take the lead for this um, endgame arc that I was talking about. Both Sonic TV shows were canceled at that point. So it was sort of looking like the comic might be over soon. So So it was just the games and the comic? Um, at this point, th- that was the only, like, yeah, part of, like, Western media, really, that was going on. Um, there was, like, this thing with the games where, like, there was a huge explosion of Sonic's relevance and popularity in the early 90s. When there was kind of this lull in the second half with because he didn't even have a game on the Sega Saturn or whatever. But, yeah, so Sonic sort of, after his shows went away, they were thinking, oh, this comic might be ending soon. So they, they ramped up to do this big arc or whatever where it led up to the milestone 50th issue and it ended with Robotnik permanently dying which was kind of like holy shit that kind of blew my mind as a kid honestly yeah it was it was it was sort of strange it, it like that like to, not to spoil it too much but eventually a different version of Robotnik called Robo Robotnik would come back and take his place so like the original version of Robotnik like legitimately died and like permanently basically like there's some weird lore shit where they talked to him like once but he's like he's he's basically dead forever like again this was gonna be the end of the comic originally but then you know they changed their mind they're like oh no this is this is selling well let's just keep making these so so yeah the comic continued after that penders wanted to write robotnik out so he could include his own original villain but that never that never actually ended up panning out the way it was the thing was the comic was sort of meandered around for 25 issues so that was two years without like the main villain and like there was all these arcs about like reclaiming the old ruined city Mo- robotropolis and, and there was all this like weird political stuff i mean it was kind of interesting but it was strange it was 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 penders doing the political stuff yes and like he definitely did contribute to that and like he wasn't the one that brought back robotnik i don't even think he would have done that if, if they didn't i'm pretty sure they were given some sort of mandate like you got to bring robotnik back obviously you know one of the benefits of having a comic like this is that they can like promote the game so like before the uh, sonic adventure one adaptation they wanted you know eggman back in the comic so they could do a sort of rough approximation of the events of the game anyways honestly there is just like a million funny weird little sonic comic things i could talk about like So many weird, just like little tangents or whatever. But I don't want to spend too much time getting into the like weeds of the comic. And also, I don't want to spend too much time rehashing stuff I talked about in that other video, which is again, not necessary to watch this, but I did have a whole video just talking about the Sonic comic. I have to, I I would be remiss. People would be upset if I didn't mention one very famous Penders issue that people like is called uh, Sonic Live. It's mostly known for this just infamous, horrifying (laughs) cover. It's sort of a strange issue where it's like Sonic's playing the game, but then it's like, it's like, oh, it's a video game. And then he includes these like pictures. Are those his kids? 
That's Pender's actual son and his niece. And yes, they were like included in this comic. That's like, comic. that's a cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it honestly is kind of cool. Again, it's just a very funny, like, again, I, I sort of go over this one in my in my comics. So I don't need to break down each page. But it's just, a, this was a famous Pender's moment. People were like, that's uh, that's interesting. Just to get this out of the way, we're looking at this art of Sonic. And compared to his previous work of like uh, Star Trek and Marvel superheroes, right? <laughs> Definitely looking a bit off those drawings are looking a bit off yeah he has a strange sort of style to it like the art here looks good but like when you look at sonic like look at his nose on that like middle panel there's just something weird to it robotnik and the robots look good but sonic looks weird yes exactly he's more adept at drawing those kinds of things let's just put more realistic more humanoid Mm -hmm. it would be fun to just talk about every weird thing that penders did in the sonic comic but i just want to focus really quickly on one particularly strange issue that uh this is an interesting one this came out in 1998 it's the sonic super special number seven it's a cross over with Image Comics, which has never once been reprinted to this day, uh, mostly because of you know copyright reasons. But like, that sounds fucking badass. It's just kind of interesting. Like in Sonic Mega Collection for the GameCube, there's a gallery where you can look at all the covers to the Sonic comic. But this one actually had to be censored. They had to like remove the copyrighted characters from it because they didn't have the rights. So he, he did this. Did he do all the art for it, or did he just write it? Yes. This is this is the, the reason I wanted to focus on this issue in particular is because it's a Pender's issue like it, it's his it's his baby basically so this is a particularly wild issue like as it's an image crossover like this it features like sonic and friends meeting like spawn yes sonic literally meets spawn in this it's, it's very strange and, and and these other famous image characters like some of these characters are in like very very adult themed comics so it's very just bizarre to have these crossing over to like in a kid's comic right the, the one of the weirdest parts of this issue is like you'd expect it would just be wow sonic and friends teaming up with these other famous comic characters uh, like, you know, just to have like an adventure. But the framing device of this issue is actually around one of Ken Pender's original characters. And it's it the framing is uh, the... the Again, I don't, I don't want to. I don't know if this image comics has anything to do with this, but the whole issue is basically presented like it's like a like an X Files parody, what but it's not like Scully and Mulder. It's Mully and Scolder. You know what I mean? You know, I don't know much about Penders, but this might be an interesting theme to start noticing. Robotnik was going to be written out for his own villain, and here the cause of action is like his original mm-hmm. character too. Like, yes, there's some very strange shit going on. Overall, I guess how would you rate these kind of earlier? works um i again i as a child i always there i was sort of enthralled by the weirdness of them like i just like sonic so it's like oh of course the sonic comic would have all this bizarre weird multi-dimensional lore bullshit going on yeah so it's actually kind of strange like you pointed out with the villain stuff there's in this issue there's like another original character which is just some villain guy it's funny he's actually not even named in the issue you can only find his name dr ian droid by scanning the copyright information, <laughs> finding his name next to uh, Particle and Tsunami, the other original characters from this issue. So again, like I said, this issue is mostly framed around this this woman superhero called Particle and like her ventures to this like multiverse type thing. It, it's very strange. The reason I'm going in so much detail about this one particular issue is because this actually was like a sort of prequel slash backdoor pilot to the Lost Ones, which was a comic that Penders published with Image Comics. Oh. Like this exact actual character. Penders apparently knew and worked with one of the co-founders of Image Comics, Jim Valentino. And this apparently led to uh, not only this strange crossover, but Ken's first foray into creator-owned comics. But unfortunately, The Lost Ones was canceled after just one issue. So we're, we, it's not too much. It's not like it wasn't some expansive success for him, unfortunately. So he was trying to use like Sonic to get some audience to the last ones. Yes, drum up some interest and hype for his, uh, yes, his original character and stuff. Now, supposedly the Lost Ones was meant to be like a more mature, dark science fiction story starring an all Asian team of superheroes. Oh, hell yeah. It's set 15 years in the future and basically Particle is like fighting against these high tech soldiers and drones and she's like on the run from the government. It stars Kerry Kurosawa, aka Particle, and the villain, again, he's not named, which is weird, but it's the same character, Dr. Ian Droid, and he's, uh, he's got like an army of like high tech soldiers and stuff. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I'm going to be honest. I'm not entirely sure what Particle's superpower is. Like, a- according to this, she has the power to control electrons, which like in the comic, that basically means she can like control electronic devices and also like fuck people's brains up and stuff. 
Honestly, okay, so I was a little upset because it w it's genuinely like nigh impossible to track down any information online about this series that isn't directly from Penders himself. And I couldn't find a full copy of it online or anywhere to like buy it, but you can read the first few pages in a preview on the archived kenpenders.com, which is now defunct. I did have, I, I searched the internet. We'll buy it. We'll buy it for you. <laughs> and I was able to find a pretty in-depth review, which included some page scans from the later parts. Uh, this is on Tumblr by a guy named Robotnik Moon, so uh, thanks to that. Particle is clearly supposed to be like the star, but like a huge amount of the POV of this issue is from like this FBI agent guy. I don't want to get too sidetracked with all the weird plot details, but there's some weird shit here. There's like flashbacks to the Enola Gay briefing and like, you know, the, the nuclear bomb drop. Like there's all these weird flashbacks that seem like they're not even related. Was he like trying to make his own Watchmen or something? Sort of. So like there's, I, I'm not 100% sure. I can't 100% guarantee this is the implication, but there's a part where she uses her powers to like fuck up someone's brain and then it's like juxtaposed with like the atomic bomb, like Hiroshima going off in the background. Like it's, it's a very... Very strange. Oh my god. I, I think the implication is like that Hiroshima might be where she got her powers from. I'm not again. I'm, is that why he made them Asian? I, I think so, yes, because yeah, the nuclear they're a, she's like a nuclear superhero. Sort of. Again, she's the power of her life. Oh it's very vague. That's why I was trying to like I'm trying to not put words in his mouth here. It's a little confusing. And again, I haven't been able to That's just you're just theory crafting. I'm just theory crafting. There is this weird thing that will happen where like he will have a character he'll have her like speak or think in like japanese but like not like japanese characters like it's just phonetically spelled out like that and then in the back of the book he will just like explain in text and like a big data dump at the back it's like this is what all the stuff that like was meant when she said that you know what i mean <laughs> I haven't read this, but that is funny. The implication of making them Asian so they can have the powers of the nuke. Again, it's pretty cool. I, 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 that might be a somewhat di like. Uh, I hope, Look, I, even I, if it's disingenuous, that was I what want, I, the vibe I was getting. It's strange. I want to believe it's true. There's also this weird, like, it, it's kind of strange. Like, sometimes they'll use, like, I already sent this image, but sometimes they'll use, like, photographed backgrounds instead of drawing them, which, to be, to be perfectly, honest, perfectly honest, I kind of like a cool mixed media yeah. thing in well, my, a, a in lot my of comics. Artists, but, a lot of comic artists do that, especially indie artists. It's just, uh, right. it's just a way to speed up the process of it. I've done that before. Definitely. I think it looks cool, but, I, you know, I've seen people online be like, oh, he's lazy for doing that or whatever. I just thought I'd point it out. So, again, I'm not here to, I don't want to, like, be showing all this stuff and telling you how to feel about it. I want, I just want to show you guys what can Penders is up to and what he's done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Was this like Ken's first, like truly, like fully, like his own creation? Yes, this is his first, like, um, well, I mean, I don't know, like, if he ever, like, like wrote any books and ever published, published or ever. Like, I this guess. is the first, yeah, like, look at his, something like, a, this was what it would be like if he had total control over something. It's a very strange book, but anyway, after, it was canceled after one issue, but I believe it provides some nice insight into, like, what Penders would do if he had total creative control on a project, which actually leads us nicely into talking about Penders' work on the Knuckles the Echidna spinoff comic. Oh, okay. I didn't even know this was a whole spinoff. I just thought this was part of Archie. Oh, yeah, like yeah, original. yes, yes. See, Penders, I, this is why I tried to make it so clear earlier that Penders absolutely had his fingers in the pie of the Sonic comic and he influenced it and he did all sorts of stuff, but he had total creative control over the Knuckles spinoff. <laughs> so after a successful three issue miniseries sold well, uh, Archie decided to make a Knuckles spinoff comic. Unlike the Sonic the Hedgehog comic, Knuckles was like brand new too, so there was like no lore for him to go off of. He was basically free to use this series to tell whatever story he wanted with basically much less oversight compared to the main series. And as he was the sole writer, he really went ham. Thing is, he didn't draw much of this. He only drew a few issues. He was, he was just mainly the writer. He did, again, he did do it occasionally, but the art's not for, the art for the most part is not that bad because it's mostly done by this guy, primarily done by this guy called Manny Galan, who just, I think he did a pretty good job. He did leave, and the, some of the issues in the later half get a little weird, but I, 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 again. What year is this? Um, I believe the Knuckles comic ran from 97 to 99. Was it right when, like, Sonic 3 came out? No, this was actually a good, like, amount of time after the fact. Like, Knuckles had some time in the Sonic comics to sort of establish himself and then build himself up as a character, gotcha. and then they tested the waters with the three-issue miniseries, so yeah. Uh, with the Sonic comic, there was little to work with from the games, and Sega was very apparently not helpful when they like they would like reach out to Sega and ask for information and stuff. They would just get snubbed or whatever. Like when the new games would come out, and they would have to like adapt them. Like they wouldn't even get like free copies or whatever. It's kind of, it was kind of fucked. Damn. So, okay, so some people are under the impression that Ken Penders is obsessed with Knuckles. And that's technically true, just not in the way some people might think. He doesn't care 
about Knuckles, like as you conceive of him, the Sega character. He only cares about his own version of Knuckles. You know what I mean? Like his own original character's Knuckles. He tried to get his own pet project off the ground and then this fell right in front of him where he's allowed to just do whatever he wants and he can get it published and he'll have readers. Right. So yeah, he basically saw Knuckles, like the comic and the character as a blank slate to project his like weird sci-fi storyline inspired by the things that he actually like liked growing up, like Star Trek and old comics and stuff. You know, rather than like try to make something similar to the game, he was not a gamer. He didn't really have any interest in the games. He just wanted to like tell stories with these characters. Hold on. He actually explained in a forum post on the KenPenders.com when they were active. He says, while you may see me favoring echidnas, keep in mind that several ideas were first submitted for use with Sonic, not Knuckles. And while shot down because Sonic was involved, they sailed through without so much as a word when aligned with Knuckles. Damn. I want to be like two, like I, I couldn't do anything you wanted, but like I, I kind of could, man. There was some weird shit in this comic. I really don't. I'm going to, I try, I try to explain it, but. Why is the title the Echidnas as Racial Survivors or Saviors? Racial Saviors. Okay. So <laughs> I don't even really have time to get into this, but there's some weird, like furry political drama with like dingoes being used as like an allegory for like oppressed races. But God. there was some weird colonial shit. I really don't. I'm really, I actually was like, I wish I could have time to get super in depth in some of the weirdness of like the actual furry politics. And honestly, mostly keeping that stuff out of here and just focusing on like the things that are going to be directly relevant coming up <laughs> yeah, later this is about his career not his furry political world i would love to do a whole two-hour thing that doesn't even talk about any of real life stuff just looking at like the content of the comics and stuff but that would that's not the story i'm here to tell today exactly maybe we'll do another episode just based off that we'll do a net lore bonus, bonus episode. exactly this is going to be very difficult but let me try to just briefly briefly explain what the comic is like and like about and the, and the general premise of it. And, and again, most of this I'm trying to condense and all this I'm talking about is going to have to be relevant later. So the general premise of the comic is that Knuckles is the lone guardian of the floating island. And he initially believes that he's the last of his race. But early into the comic, he stumbles into the future, like the secret futuristic city of Echidnaopolis, which contained like the whole Echidna civilization. It, it's sort of confusing. It was like on the floating island the whole time, but like in a pocket dimension. This was well before the Aztec-inspired civilization of the Echidnas in Sonic Adventure 1. This is like a totally sort of different vibe. This is a lot more like... This is the future. You know, it's like a... It's a futuristic advanced cities and stuff. It's kind of strange. Like, even in the past, it's kind of advanced. It's strange. Like, Echidnas are sort of portrayed as this technologically advanced species. <laughs> I don't really know. Wait, these... They were all just it's, on it's, the again, island? It's very confusing. It's like a... It, it was sort of like a hidden society, but... They're sort of aware of it, but Knuckles Knuckles thought he was like alone on the island for like his whole life or whatever. And he thought he was like the last echidna. It's very strange. <laughs> like again, immediately, because like in the games, that's sort of established. Knuckles is the only protector of the floating island. That's like the only thing from the games that was established. He finds this futuristic city that just exists on the island that he didn't know about. He just didn't know about it. It was, there's some complicated dimension shenanigans. Dimensions are called zones in Sonic. So if I say zone, I'm basically just mean like another dimension. It was like time displaced, but like in the same place. It's very confusing. I, I have to admit. Of course, after this, some of the more infamous Penders pictures is, is there's a lot of Echidna characters introduced from Echidnaopolis, and people have taken it upon themselves to sort of make fun of how similar they all look or whatever. Yeah, like, I was looking at them. They're like A lot of them just look like Knuckles. It's like sort of a like web of clones. clones or whatever. There's this part where they talk about Knuckles' lineage, and it's just like a bunch of Knuckleses. <laughs> And there's like this infamous image, this one in particular people like to use where it's like they put labels on all of them like, oh, there's science knuckles and Star Trek knuckles and eyebrow knuckles. Are these the official names? No, no, no. These are just okay, fan names or whatever. Like super knuckles bro one. There's mohawk knuckles, knuckles, douchebag knuckles, cyborg knuckles. Anyways, the punchline, of course. Clockwork orange knuckles. After you get through girl knuckles and beer knuckles, you get to the bottom and there's knuckles and he's just called Red Sonic. <laughs> So um, it's, this is sort of hard to even explain. There's this sort of weird like obsession over like Knuckles' lineage and his like history. And like Penders will provide these like bonus like pages where he's like, hey kids, why don't you take a look at my family tree or whatever? You know what I mean? Like this is all Knuckles' <laughs> thing. And then there was this later one that was like, here, here, why don't you, you know, do a little pop quiz and, and see if you can fill Holy in shit. all of Knuckles' ancestors. It's like. No, no kid in the world <laughs> cared about doing that. I don't know. This is so strange to me. But yes, there were many echidna characters. I don't want to oversell it. There were still plenty of non-echidna characters, like the chaotix and stuff. Yeah, okay, but I like this. It says, when a relation of mine who hasn't been seen so far in one of my adventures does turn up, 
you can then jot their name down in the proper spot. He was expecting people to like really keep track of every single one. It's just, just like strange, right? There's something funny about it. And there's also, you can see on this, there's you can see a clear naming convention with like the female echidnas versus the male echidnas. Like the uh, the female echidnas all have like Kryptonian names, like Lara Sue or Julie Sue or, or like Lara Lee or like Lien Da. Whereas the male echidnas all have like, they're like named after like philosophers and shit, like Locke and Athair and Sojourner and, and, and Matthias <laughs> and Rembrandt. Like, that's what the echidnas are named. And Steppenwolf and, and Menneker. Like, it's it's just so strange to me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Because, like, then there's Knuckles, who's just Knuckles. You know what I mean? Well, he wasn't part of the society. E- exactly. Know? Well, he, he was... I'll, I'll sort of get into this later. He was he was born in Echidnopolis and then sort of taken outside of it by his father. It's, it's, it's a strange... I gotta know this story. You gotta give me, like, the cliff notes. I will I will explain Knuckles' backstory when it comes up in the comics. I need to... I'm still not even done <laughs> explaining, like, the premise of the comics yet because there's... Okay. <laughs> I haven't even talked about the antagonists yet. So the, the main antagonists are a, a group called the Dark Legion, which is a cult of technologically advanced echidnas which sort of like worship technology and they and they they've they've been uh, banished to another dimension called the twilight zone where time moves more slowly <laughs> it's literally called that and time moves more slowly relative to mobius and they only recently escaped and have begun to try and take over angel island and echidnopolis their leader is a guy known as dimitri who would later be known as Enerjack. but uh, i'm just bringing him up because he might Enerjack. yeah Enerjack. like he's like an energy like he, he absorbs a bunch of chaos emerald power and he becomes like this freaky looking superhero. Fucking like electro. He honestly has a very strange looking design. Enerjack. He's kind of cool looking, honestly. And these are also echidnas. Yes. And, and yes, he is also an echidna. Is that part of their like racial savior thing that they're all in robes? Um, there's some weird aspect like that, but it's not really related to the well, like it kind of is related to the Dark Legion, but don't worry about it. So, oh wait, hold on. Before I move on from the Dark Legion, there's a funny little part where Knuckles like knocks one out and like takes her disguise, and he even he was, even he's like, "Boy, it's a good thing we echidnas are all roughly the same size. Other this, otherwise, this plan wouldn't have worked." <laughs> so, one of the most major and important characters of this comic is a character known as Julie Sue, who is like girl Knuckles. She's a pink Knuckles, and she was originally a member of the Dark Legion, but. This is a little strange. Like, upon seeing Knuckles, she, like, immediately sort of, like, falls in love with him. It's sort of complicated because there's this weird thing about echidna biology called a soul touch where it's, like, instead of, like, a mating ritual, as soon as you, like, see the person you're compatible with, you just, like, instantly fall in love with them. It's, it's kind of strange. So Julie Sue, Julie Sue is his love interest. Exactly, yes. Um, basically, another antagonist is Lien Da, who's like Julie Sue's like half sister, and she's part of the uh, Dark Legion as well. She's still part of the Dark Legion. Exactly. Um, again, if it seems like I'm just bringing up a bunch of weird echidna characters, all this will become relevant later. These characters will become relevant at a later point. Mm-hmm. There is uh, definitely a lot of weird elements to the comic that I don't even really know how to work in. Like one of the major aspects of this comic is that they coexist with a telepathic fire ant society and they're like political partners or whatever. It's very strange. There's a lot of lost societies and like hidden societies and this, I mean, it's kind of strange. So another weird thing that sort of comes up is that there's a obvious bend towards making Knuckles like this weird savior character. Like He's like the chosen one. He's going to save everyone. Like there's a part where he dies. And he, like he's like atomized, but instantly brought back to life. So he's sort of resurrected. And there's like this part Jesus. of the end of this arc where he literally walks on water. Like it's not even. Oh my God. It's, it's not even particularly <laughs> subtle. You know what I mean? Like I'm not like a genius for <laughs> pointing this out. All right. Now let's talk about one of just the strangest. Like I don't even know what to say about this thing. This is one of those strangest Penders moments. This is a certified Penders moment. There's just this interesting part in issue 22. So just briefly, there's there's sort of a, a an arc about the rise of like echidnas becoming like fascists and they're sort of trying to take over echidnopolis and it's not it's not particularly subtle, you know what I mean? There's like some weird Nazi salutes and shit where they're like smashing windows or whatever. But at the beginning of this issue, before the issue even starts, there's a little poem on like the title like in like a credit like credit page. So let me just let me just read this poem to you. Okay. During Robotnik's takeover through roboticization, the SWAT bots came for the foxes, and I did not speak up because I was not a fox. Then they came for the rabbits, and I did not speak up because I was not a rabbit. Then they came for the squirrels, but I did not speak up because I was not a squirrel. 
Then they came for the hedgehogs, and I did not speak up because I was an echidna. Then they came for me, and by that time, nobody was left to speak up. The fuck? Anonymous. <laughs> so you gotta explain what that fucking quote is. To yes, people. if you weren't aware, if you aren't particularly, you know, historically, this is actually like a very famous like Holocaust poem by Martin Niemöller or whatever. But he just like changed the words around to make it a, about echidnas and he doesn't like provide any credit to him or whatever I mean, he did change like i don't know if you need to provide credit if it's like a parody or but it's just it's just a very Parodying. it's extremely strange like right like you have very, to very distasteful it, yes exactly people could consider it t- like distasteful or whatever so you know pender's obviously you know people have called him out about this How did he get you know later print? and of course he's apologize for this tasteless mistake and uh, no i'm just kidding he's actually never apologized in fact he's like doubled down on this like hmm uh, i find it interesting that certain readers get up in arms over the use of the martin niemoller quote in knuckles issue 22 while not saying a word about the mind Kampf <laughs> quote in knuckles 23 or the fdr quote in knuckles 24 which is like that's that's gonna be there's a, a mind, deflection wait, that, there's, there's a, a mind Kampf 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 quote, quote? A pay, okay this one, I couldn't even get this, like, confirmed or whatever, because, like... Well, that's him saying it in 2018. So here, this, this, is, this is the quote that he's referring to. The Dark Legion was never defeated. We were stabbed in the back by the weak and greedy in power. The true echidna civilization is destined to rule over the world of Mobius. <laughs> Only a strong leader, such as myself, can save Echidnopolis from the radicals and techno-conservatives who wish us back into the Stone Age. It's <laughs> Menneker addressing his troops after emerging from their imprisonment in another zone. So... I don't, I didn't, okay, I, I didn't read Mein Kampf for this. I'm sorry, I know that's, I'm a Whoa, fake, what the hell? I'm a fake fan. But um, apparently, like, this is, uh, I don't know if this is a direct quote from Mein Kampf, but either way, this is a direct reference to uh, this thing called this the stab in the back myth, which is this anti-Semitic German propaganda they used as a cope for losing World War One, where they just blamed it all on the Jews or whatever. So it's just so, if you want to make a story about, like, fascist rising to power, that's one thing, but, like, to do, you repurpose these, like, direct real world things just for your story about furry echidnas and stuff it, it's strange right like it's pretty strange right yeah i don't i've n- i never even knew about that of course he's the one calling attention to it right like that's just the fact the fact that he doubled down was like well nobody complained when i used a mind comp yeah. quote i actually made two holocaust comparisons right like okay that doesn't make it better <laughs> It's, um, that's gotta be one of my top favorite Penders moments. So now let's sort of skip forward a bit to Knuckles issue 25. This was the only like major milestone, like, like a big number issue they celebrated or whatever. And so it would go on to be canceled not too long after this, after just 32 issues. And sort of the crux of this issue is that it's about Knuckles finally reuniting with his father or whatever. Like, so. Okay. Is this when we get into the family tree I will stuff? explain a little bit more about the, uh, yes, the lore behind Knuckles' background and story and whatnot. So Knuckles is finally reunited with his father, Locke, who basically looks like Knuckles, but wearing a bathrobe and with a little goatee. And, like, <laughs> this is the first time he's seen him since he was abandoned, like, as a child. Let me explain what Locke did. So Locke basically took Knuckles out of his society when he was an extremely young boy and, like, raised him on his own for a while, like, in the wilderness, and lied to him and said he was the last remaining member of his species. Then he jumped into a (laughs) giant wall of fire, which was actually secretly a hologram, and left Knuckles on his own to, like, fend for himself and, like, grow up on his own. And, like, to be, like, like, to teach him how to be, like, self-sufficient or whatever. But, like, he was, like, secretly (laughs) watching Knuckles the entire time through, like, a series of cameras. It's, it's, it's very strange. Fucking, why did he do that? To make, because he had to, well, okay, yes, so he, he had to make Knuckles strong or whatever because he had this crazy vision one night about the world was going to end and he had to, he had to only, the only person in the world who could save, like, save the planet was his own son i love how i love his dad's design it's just him with like a fucking beard I'm like, a bathrobe. so knuckles father Locke explains like some weird shit like he has like this weird nightmare premonition where he explains that he he knows he just somehow knew his son would be the chosen one it would be the only one that could stand up against some massive calamity in the future so he wakes up from his nightmare and he naturally does the only thing that makes any sense, which is that he took Knuckles' egg and then he just took it down and he blasted it with Chaos Emerald radiation because he <laughs> just wanted to hopefully give him superpowers or something. Oh yeah, by the way, if you didn't know, echidnas are one of the only mammals that lay eggs, and, and I'm glad that he could incorporate that fun fact into the story. 
Apparently it worked because Knuckles has spikes on his hands and that's like a weird mutation. Like, oh. like you can see in one of these later pages, Locke will take his gloves off. And even though he's wearing the same weird like spiky white boxing gloves as Knuckles, he's like, no, no, these are just like ceremonial for the guardians. Like he's, he's, a, he's as I explained, Locke is a former guardian. Like Knuckles' lineage is a long series of people who would guard the floating island. So he's like, Knuckles, he has to be powerful and strong as a guardian. So everyone else is just wearing gloves, but Knuckles actually Knuckles has like actually the actually has the spikes. Like- it's crazy, right? Right? And it, like, it's just funny because like nobody knew that nobody else had the spikes until he revealed that all this stuff. <laughs> it's kind of funny because like he info dumps all this stuff, including like a bunch of echidna lore and backstory, like a lot of it. And then Knuckles is just like, oh, didn't it ever occur to you? I would have liked being your son. And Locke is like, I did what I had to do. And Knuckles is like, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about it that way. I guess you're right. Oh, I love you, dad. And then he completely like <laughs> forgives him. And it's like, but the rest of the series, they just have like this really weirdly normal, like father son relationship. It's, it's kind of strange. <laughs> Even though like, yeah, he just, abandon him in like the middle of nowhere right and he didn't even like he'd like reveal himself like oh I saw he like Knuckles like saw him like reflecting off of this like piece of metal and then Locke tried to like run away and then like Knuckles just caught him and he's like oh like, fuck, <laughs> fuck I guess I'll just you know I'll let him <laughs> like an asshole. so there's this weird thing I don't want to get too psychoanalyst like armchair psychologist about this but there's this weird recurring theme that shows up like that no matter how bad or weird like a father figure fucks up or treats their child the story will always bend over backwards to like it gives some weird esoteric explanation as to why they're actually right the whole time well you know his son's gonna be reading this and it's just again I don't even have time to get into it there's there's a whole another thing that Penders wrote in the Sonic comic where Sally's dad King Acorn was like he's acting he's giving all these weird orders like he even ordered like the genocide of a certain like like these these free the, the robots that have free will he's like we can't take any chances we gotta we gotta kill them all or whatever and then like later like sally was like ah oh, you know like she she objects to it but then later she's like oh, i shouldn't have objected to my dad he was just trying to be pragmatic he was just doing what he had to do and there's a part where she like goes in this weird goop and has like a spiritual vision where she communes with like god and god is basically just like i give your father vision so don't ever question anything he ever says he's always just i know he's being weird but he, i promise everything he ever did was just he was trying to look out for you and he had your best interest in heart it's all just like oh okay so there's this weird little like editor's box that says, you'll have to check out an upcoming Sonic Super Special featuring the epic Knuckles 20 years later to see the full story. Now that promised comic like Knuckles 20 years in the future special never actually materialized, oh. pre- presumably because the comic got canceled. But just keep that in mind because it will be coming up again later. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm almost at the end of my like echidna like Knuckles notes, but I, I, I basically completely accidentally skipped past the part where I explain like, the, the the lore like the echidna lore so let me briefly just try and explain like what's the deal with the floating island or whatever this is my attempt to summarize echidna lore without even having super clearly defined notes on it so way back in the day there was going to be this meteor that like was going to land and crush their city or whatever and they're like oh we don't want our city to get crushed so they use the power of the chaos emeralds to lift their city out of the ground and now they have a, now they're all on a big floating island in the sky or whatever after a while of just sort of floating around, some of the echidnas here decided that they, maybe we should land back in the ground or whatever. And like, apparently after like, you know, th- like there's, th- there's some boring political stuff where like they have, they t- goes in front of a council and he explains why we should go back in the ground and they decide against him. And this guy's like, oh, that really pisses me off. So there's a bit of, bit of a brief echidna civil war over this. And like, there's some drama where some guy absorbs a bunch of chaos emerald energy and he gets like really powerful. Anyways, eventually the insurrectionists are put down and uh, the echidnas of Echidnopolis decide to like outlaw technology <laughs> and oh like God. everyone has to give away like their VCRs and video game systems and shit. And those are like real examples of shit used that they had to like give up. And everyone's like, like they just show this weird little couple pages where everyone's just like chill. Like, yeah, I'm happy to give away all my shit. You know, I'd love to just go back to being like in tune with nature. dream, man. Right. Like everyone's doing that except like one gu- creepy guy who's like, oh, I don't want to give away my technology. And then, um, you know, he, th- there's like this weird anti-technology, like, like ideological thing there. But the, and the resistors eventually become portrayed as the bad guy, bad guys. Like they, they, they become this weird tech cult, which eventually morphs into the dark legion or whatever. Like, all I'm going to say is you've seen people in America react to the thought when people want to take their guns away. Now imagine trying to take away like, all their technology, all you know their what I mean? Phones and computers. And these, and these are the bad guys, remember? And it's it's extra, like there's like a double layer of extra confusing shit on it. Because in modern day Echidnopolis, people are still using technology all over the place. Like it's still super advanced, but it's like it's like not forbidden technology or something. It, it's very confusing. So that's like the basic sort of premise of Echidnopolis. 
and the uh, comic. So, all right. So now it's after issue 25. Knuckles has finally linked up with his dad and you, you expect shit to start getting like real now, right? But the next three issues, like the next arc is dedicated to like dating and like dating troubles. And Knuckles is like, oh, I wish Julie Sue would go out on a date with me. And <laughs> like all this really weird. This is also where the art starts to get a little weird in some of the places. I'm going to have to send you some of these pictures after the fact because there's just some really weird dating related lore in here. And like, oh, Knuckles is like, like one of the issues, his big endings is, wow, he, he asked her out on a date. <laughs> that is a and, fucking awesome panel. Holy shit. She yeah. said yes. There's some uh, great, there's some great, there's a great, hold on. Look at that fucking bottom right, like text. It's crunch time, gang. But will our boy come through in the clinch? <laughs> what does that mean? I don't even know. There, you, I don't. I don't have any picture saved for this. But every time Vector talks, it's like Pender's attempt at like urban speak, and it's very cringy <laughs> and whatever. I, that sounds awesome. I'll look for stuff to show on screen for that. Oh my god, Vector talking about fucking drive-bys. Yo, B, don't you know drive-bys can hurt somebody? <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's it's very strange. I have I have to admit, it's it's a very strange like way to write a character. This is when his dad has to like sit Knuckles down and explain like the process of echidna mating oh, yeah, biology he doesn't to Knuckles. Because he just grew up in a fucking forest or whatever. Does Sonic appear in this at all? Uh, occasionally Sonic would show up. Like there would be a little bit of crossover between these comics, but nothing too major. Okay, so yeah. So there's a part where Knuckles is like, he like shows up to his dad's place and his dad is making pancakes again this is like immediately after they've been reunited after being separated their whole life and he's like oh look what the cat dragged in i have some breakfast and he's like are you okay son it looks like something's on your mind and he's like i was wondering about why boys and girls get together <laughs> and he's like he's like and his dad's like freaks out and he's like what do you want to know and he's like it's julie sue dad i feel weird whenever i'm with her and he's like yeah i'm like happy and mad at the same time and it's like i i, I think she's angry but i think she wants to be friends He's like, how is that different when you're with other friends? He's like, oh, but I get along great with my other friends. He's like, it's like, sure, Vector can be a pain at times, but he's okay most of the time. And his dad's like, are you friends with other girls? And he's like, I don't even think about other girls, dad. It's like, sounds to me like you've been struck by the soul touch. <laughs> he's like, soul touch? What's that? He's like, we kidnas tend to develop our intellectual side more so than any other. So it's nature's way of balancing the scales. <laughs> Uh, and then there's sort of a... Wait, is... Okay, th there's actually a page you can skip here. So then there's goes, Nature has provided us a means for us to recognize our life partner from the opposite sex. Oh, that means the boy and the girl are compatible, right? Uh, it usually works that way, yes. Uh, then what happened with you and mom? Uh, which is funny, because Locke is, like, divorced from <laughs> Knuckles' mom. Because she didn't like that he stole Knuckles and threw him out in the wilderness, you know, but he wasn't able to be raised by he, his mother. He had a you nightmare. Know? He's like, good question. I've often wondered that myself. I guess even the best of relationships require a lot of work. And then Knuckles is like, ah, I get along great with the guys. It's Julie Sue I have my problems with. Wouldn't it be easier if guys hung around with guys and girls hung around <laughs> themselves? Girls stuck to themselves? He's like, probably. But eventually they'd want something more. And he's like, more? He's like, oh, why don't we figure out what to do about your feelings for Julie Sue before discussing anything more? So Knuckles basically just asks his dad, like, oh, come on, dad, can't I just be gay? And his dad's like, no, no, don't, like, don't worry about yeah, that, like, son. I like that he oppresses his dad. He's like, aren't you divorced? Yeah, he totally calls him out. It's so funny. I don't know why. That cracks me up. It is just a weird thing. Like Locke is a very like shitty character, but he's always portrayed as like doing the right thing. It's really funny. There's, again, there's this whole fucking arc. This is also, like I explained, when shit gets just very banal and, like, boring. And, like, it's surprising how boring this stuff can even be. Like, there's all this, there's, like, the, all these pages dedicated to, like, Knuckles' mom getting remarried and stuff. Like, imagine being a kid. Oh my God. And you play Knuck Sonic, Sonic, and you're like, oh, this is cool. I want to read the, and you, you, like, like the character Knuckles. I want to read the Knuckles comic. And then you open it up. You don't even up. start from the beginning. You just pick up an issue. And it's, it's like a two-page spread of, like, Knuckles' mom getting married and then all this, like, interpersonal drama stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Again, I could, I could literally talk about, like, this arc, probably. I could do a two-hour podcast on just the dating arc. We'll do the, so I'm we'll gonna have do to the move 10 long. episode Ken Penders. Bonus. Yeah, we're going to have to start a sub-podcast <laughs> series. Ken lore. So, basically, not too long after that, um, the comic would get canceled. There was basically one more arc where Knuckles fought a purple gorilla guy, and then that was it. It was sort of just unceremoniously canceled. But, you know, as Penders would continue writing for the Sonic comic, Knuckles' adventures would continue for some time. I don't really have time to get into every little weird thing Penders would continue to do on the Sonic comic, but one just 
bizarre, just absolutely just insane thing that people always point out about Pender's tenure in the comic is it, there's a part where Knuckles became green. Like, <laughs> it's not like, you know, Super Sonic goes yellow and it's like, okay, whatever. It's not a big deal. This wasn't, this was like a permanent upgrade. Like he became like Dr. Manhattan levels of like powerful and he was just green for, and this last year for like 30 issues. So for like years, Knuckles was just green. What the fuck happened? Why is he green? He's a living chaos emerald basically is the explanation. And eventually one day he just, it just gets fixed and it's, it's not even, there's not even like a cool climax to Probably it. It's like very Sega strange. Like why the fuck is he green? It does seem very strange from like a marketing perspective. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the reason I, I, I mentioned Ken going back to the Sonic comic is because he would eventually leave. But before leaving, he would he would uh, pen his magnum opus, his final hurrah on the comic, which was the Mobius 25 years later arc. OK, now this is basically sort of the arc that he was wanting to hint at, you know, like in that Knuckles 20 years later bullshit. And uh, there's actually this weird thing in Sonic Super Special where where Dr. Ian Droid sort of implied that he was going to get to know Knuckles in the future. Like, he was going to be the villain of this arc, but that never ended up panning out either. This was an arc that lasted from Sonic 131 through Sonic 144, but not, like, as the, necessarily the primary story in each issue. It was usually presented as, like, the shorter backup story up until the final issue, which was, like, the main dish of the issue. This arc takes a look at characters, as you might imagine, 25 years in the future with, like, a radically altered status quo. Like, Sonic and Sally are king and queen. Like, Robotnik is gone. He's been completely defeated. Uh, Knuckles and Julie Sue have this teenage daughter now called Laura Sue. She'll be important later. And honestly, I was sitting down to like do a real like thorough breakdown of, of the Mobius 25 years later arc, but I just could not handle it. It was so fucking boring. It is like <laughs> peak penders. It is nothing but people standing around and talking the whole time. Like you'd think they'd take advantage of this unique scenario and setting to like tell some interesting, cool future stories, but it's just people talking about stuff and and, like standing around. And it's not even like interesting, good things. It's like weird, boring stuff. Like it's like all social aspects. Like, oh, we're king and queen. We have to worry about all these like social responsibilities we have to gather. You'd think it would take advantage of the interesting like scenario, but it's basically them just talking about weird, boring stuff related to their social status. Like who could forget riveting issues like, my dinner with Sonic or slumber party or girl talk where they're, they're literally the whole episode is just them gossiping on video phones the entire time. Jeez. And all, this is what they, occasionally, they did for the future episode. Right. Exactly. This is what, this was like a, like an arc and people were kept expecting interesting things to happen, but I assure you nothing interesting happened. Like it's kind of funny though, because like interesting things sort of happened, but like in, in the time gap between them, like there's a, there's a part where Sonic and Knuckles are talking and they, he just, they briefly have a flashback remembering what was going on. So like apparently in this time, like Knuckles went mental and became a living chaos emerald again and like literally killed Robotnik and like was going to take over the world and remake Mobius in his image. But Sonic had to like take him down with some weird futuristic gadget, which is why Knuckles is like missing an eye in this future timeline. Now, ostensibly, Mobius 25 years later is like a, a coming of age story for Laura Sue. Like it starts with her parents arguing over her unveiling, which is like like a fancy social ball or whatever for like echidna girls when they turn 16. And there's like a lot of drama about like, oh, I don't want to go to my unveiling. I want to be a guardian like you, dad. And he's like, no, you can't be a guardian like me. You have to you have to be a good girl, Echidna. And then later he just remembers his shitty dad. And he's like, oh, I had a great dad, but he, I, he was fucked up and he, I should just let her be a guardian. So she gets to be a guardian because Knuckles just, just, just decides to change his mind. Anyways, the, the real conflict of this arc is basically just a bunch of characters get in a room and they start talking about weird science bullshit like oh the fabric of reality is breaking down because of all the weird shit that's happened in the past so all the characters gather around to talk about it of course and they decide they need to send someone back in time and basically the only thing that really happens in the entire arc is that sonic it ends with sonic stepping into a time machine and as it activates both he and laura sue suddenly disappear so it literally ends on a cliffhanger too <laughs> anyways after working on the comic since 1994 penders eventually left the series after issue 159 and uh, this was released in February 2006, for the record. And according to him, he quit because he just wanted more creative freedom over his projects, and he wanted to be able to pursue a creative career in Hollywood as well. Now, before moving on from the comics, I'd like to take a look at a letter that appeared in the back of issue 103. This is uh, from the year 2001. Like, sometimes, you know, in comics, fans would send in letters to the editor, and they'd get, like, printed in the back, and they'd get replied to or whatever, you know what I mean? Now, I'm just going to read a very brief snippet from this letter. Moving along to the Knuckles segment, Mr. Penders does a decent job throughout the book. 
there's no particular rise or drop in quality. To be honest, I haven't been his biggest fan when it comes to furry art, but he can draw humans far better than I, so I have no room to talk. Considering how he was first drawn, Mecha Dimitri is on model with enough insane detail to satisfy me. The only qualms I really have are Green Knuckle's bony knees, Tobor's eyes on page 8, and Commissar's body proportions on page 3. I don't know what bugs me about her on page 3, she just does. Regardless of those few points, the quality is consistent and it gets the story across. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting letter pointing out some of his problems. And this was actually, uh, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about like the, like his verdict that, you know, he's furry guys look kind of weird. Like there's weird musculature. Like you can see in Knuckles, his, green Knuckles, his legs, right? Like that's a weird thing I wanted to like hang on. Like, so you're, you're the artist here. You, we were sort of touched on this earlier. This is when I, when I was going to bring it up. Like, what do you think of his art? Like it's, it's very, it's got a style to it, right? Like I don't know how to explain it. I'm not, I'm not an art guy. Yeah, they don't. Not not every panel looks horrible. The humans look really good. A lot of the backgrounds look pretty good. Mm -hmm. But whenever he draws like the Sonic characters, there's something off about them. Yeah, like as you mentioned, like there's like a weird like muscular look to them where he tries to like mm -hmm. he tries to like add some kind of like anatomy like to it, like but like realistic anatomy to where you get these weird curvatures. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, when he draws like the more cartoony faces, he'll like put features in the wrong place. Like he'll he'll put the nose too close into the mouth. All right. Anyways, the, the reason I brought this letter up in the first place is because it was actually written by none other than Ian Flynn, going by the name Ian Potto, who would uh, he would actually be tapped as the head writer to take over the comic following Pender's departure. Oh. Unlike Pender's, he was actually a huge Sonic fan and like incorporated all this stuff like from the games, like all these old characters like Bean and Bark. Like, I think he's just, you know, overall, he was just way better suited to write for these characters and stuff. And I think his run was generally well received by fans. Like, of course, he has some critics, but it's not too controversial to say that his take on the comic was more popular and better aligned with, like, the games. And, like, again, it still had, the comic still had its own crazy canon, but, like, better aligned with the games. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyways, I always thought Ian was a very cool guy because, uh, personally, I had some, I, I had some interactions with him in the past. He actually showed up in my Sonic LP thread back in 2008, and he would answer uh, questions about the comic and, oh. like, stuff in the thread, like, between when I was making videos and stuff. And, like, he even made a couple of videos for my thread about, like, the history of the comics, He's which like was really something cool awful to see. Either. Yeah, he was a goon. He was an actual goon. Like, tying it back to fucking something awful again, right? Anyways, um... So not only would he go on to write for like the comics, he's basically, he was the main writer up through uh, 2020 when he stepped down from main, he, uh, like he's sharing the like head writer position with someone now, but he's still like involved and he's still a writer on the comics. And Ian Flynn has literally been announced that he's going to be writing for the next Sonic the Hedgehog video game, Sonic Frontiers. So oh. he's had quite the career from like sending in fan letters to the Sonic comic to, like, he's going to write the next actual mainline game. Like, I, 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 will, I have no idea exactly, like, they don't announced all the details about that yet. Like, I don't know if he's one writer of many or if he's the main writer, but he's writing the next Sonic game. That's pretty cool, honestly. <laughs> it's time to get into one of the main reasons anyone even knows about Ken Penders in the first place. And I may, this may come across as me laying this out in perhaps more detail than is fully necessary, but only because I myself have been guilty of like glossing over some of the finer details of this in the past, which is that we're entering the lawsuit saga where this is like, well, let's begin where it began, I suppose. So on January 1st, 2009, without Archie's knowledge, Ken Penders filed a copyright for every single one of the characters that he created during his time on the comic, which is a rather extensive list. I'll show it later. But, um, in April 2010, the U.S. Copyright Office actually began certifying his copyright claims because apparently that's just how like they work. Like they they'll certify your shit, and if like you have an issue yeah, with someone trying to copyright it. something, you have to reach out and stop them. So this is what caused Archie Comics to file a lawsuit against him and claiming that he had breached contract and they served him with a cease and desist. They claimed that as this was a licensed comic. Everything, like, created for it legally belonged to Sega, and that Penders had signed a work-for-hire contract, which would relinquish any rights to anything he created. Now, to cut a long and somewhat embarrassing court case short, apparently Archie's legal team failed to produce said contract, only eventually presenting a photocopy of a document from 1996 assigned by Penders. However, they were unable to provide the original, and Penders disputed this photocopy on well, the multiple fronts, like, first of all, it's a photocopy, which I don't even know if those are fully admissible, but he also claimed, like, it was a full-on forgery, like a fabrication, and, and he also explained that, you know, he started working in the comic in 1993, not 96, so it wouldn't even cover 
his first few years of work, even if it did somehow count. But because they were unable to produce his original contract, Archie ultimately had no choice but to settle with him. And all the, the exact details of the settlement aren't public. It, he appears to retain all the rights to his characters, as I'll expand upon in a minute. And Archie began systematically removing all of like Pender's characters from the comic. Now, in response to the lawsuit, the comics actually had like an in-universe event known as like the Super Genesis Wave, which basically rewrote reality to just completely soft reboot the comic without any of these characters owned by Penders. And getting made, rid of all the like echidna shit. Which it can't be, yes, exactly, all the echidna shit's gone. And it can't really be overstated how like, um, like he, he made a lot of characters and a lot of them were pretty like fundamental to the status quo of the comic. So this was like a major, major shakeup to like change things and like sort of keep it more and they changed the reality just be more in line with the games and stuff and in addition to that you know lots of little tweaks there were a lot of strict mandates handed down about what they were and weren't allowed to do specifically like with family members to main characters and like romantic relationships basically they didn't want any like future pender situations you know like but like lots yeah. of little flavor from the comic was stripped like like the planet was no longer mobius anymore it was just sonic's world you know what i mean like they like a lot of things people have gotten used to after like years many 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 years of reading this comic people like it just totally changed the status quo people were like some people were upset i gotta say i don't know there's this interesting fan interview from 1999 here where penders actually sort of acknowledges that he apparently seems to understand, like, he seems to mention that Sega would own all of his characters. Like, he knew that. Yet, apparently, he just changed his mind. He's like, oh, I was just misinformed about the legality of the situation. And, I mean, he did get his characters, so I don't know. Look, I'm no legal expert. I don't really want to, like, be giving my uninformed, cold takes about, like, what exactly, like, should or shouldn't have gone down in, in the court of law. But just from my outside perspective, it seems like some major incompetence on Archie Comics part. Like, it yeah. can't be understated how skewed the law is towards and in favor of the publisher in these types of lawsuits, you know? There are not a lot of historical cases of some lone trader just suing a big publisher. Like, Archie's been around since, like, Golden Age, since the 1939. Like, they should not have lost his case. Like, like some guy suing the, the big company like this, actually walking away with all their original characters, you know? Like... This is, it was fucked. Not only could they not find Ken's contract, it came out that they couldn't produce an original copy from any of their previous contributors who worked on the comic. So it's like, it left the door yeah, open for anyone to make similar claims. That's a level of incompetence. It, it, it was bizarre, you know? Like, people want to be like, too, like, blame it all on Penders, but maybe if Archie was just, did their jobs properly, <laughs> none of that would have even had to happen in the first place. So... Penders recently put out a long list on Twitter showing off all the characters and concepts that he now claims ownership over. And as you can see, it's a pretty long list. Uh, there's some interesting things on here like Evil Sonic and Robo Robotnik, you know. The vast majority of this stuff is just like one-off characters, shit nobody gives a fuck about. But there's just some funny stuff on here. Some of his funnier named characters, like you can see one called Sleuth Doggy Dog, which was like a real... <laughs> That was a real named character in the Sonic comics. I'm not even making that up. And um, another, like, just, just, it's just funny seeing it in text. Like, he owns the concept of the Fire Ant Society and stuff, you know what I mean? And <laughs> he, he owns Echidna Society. Yeah, exactly. And there, there's this one that just cracked me up when I read this. I couldn't, I just couldn't fathom. I was, it, it says Zoot Shoot. It's one of the, and there, the images came into you in a weird order, but... Yes, he apparently copyrighted something called the Zoot Shoot. So I had to, I had to know. I was like, what is the Zoot Shoot? What is the Zoot Shoot? Apparently, the Zoot Shoot is like this slide. It's just a slide, like a little hole where you can go down a hole and slide to the Emerald Chamber in the floating <laughs> island. Like, I don't know why he felt it was like, I better get the concept of the Zoot Shoot from else, Archie. Otherwise, this is going to show up in a game. I don't want them to be making money off of my Zoot Shoot concept, and I, and I need to have full... Why is it called the Zoot Shoot? What I does don't know. Mean? That's just what the hole is called, okay? <laughs> but yeah, so there. There's the Zoot Shoot and whatnot. So oh yeah, actually, like I sort of alluded to earlier, Ken actually inspired another guy, the a former editor who worked on Archie, to sort of sue them over ownership of characters he had. Like, specifically, he wanted the character of Mammoth Mogul, who was this sort of important original character antagonist who would show up in a few different arcs. But, like, the weirdest thing was, like, even though the case was eventually, like, dismissed against him, like, he did not win this case... He was still trying to sell, like, Mammoth Mogul merchandise. It was extremely strange. Wait, he lost? Yeah, the case was eventually dismissed. I don't know. The full details of this case are not super well known, but, like, I, I'm not entirely sure when, what, what went down. But, like, he really wanted to sell, like, like it's just so strange to me. Like, he, he was offering to sell a Mammoth Mogul, like, 
uh, like comic book, like 32 full pages. Like obviously that didn't exist yet. And like, he's like, you, you can, you can order an official Mammoth Mogul DVD brand animated series when it's like, he doesn't even have concept art to show. This character does not look good. <laughs> it is a very, yeah, it's, it's not a, like, a, like, I don't know why, like you would like think, oh, people are definitely gonna be clamoring over themselves to buy like Mammoth Mogul merchandise. You know what I mean? Or like, and impenders have like had the same thing where people make fun of them. like nobody, cares about most of your original Mammoth characters mogul trading cards right for three dollars so strange yeah this is all about a guy called scott fullop it's uh this is a whole again this is another saga that i don't have time to get into i just thought it was worth mentioning that like can really open the door for like a lot of weird lawsuit bullshit um honestly if if all this like owning an alternate version of a character like how can pender's own evil sonic that doesn't make any sense but like it's it's not as unprecedented as you might think honestly um there was a bitter legal battle apparently between todd mcfarlane and neil gaiman over the rights to medieval spawn who was a character created in a guest issue by gaiman and like now he owns like 50 percent of the rights to him or something or there was some weird trade where they like he traded the rights to one of his original characters and then mcfarlane could keep spawn that is a it's great just, design medieval spawn yeah, yeah it actually is kind of cool but yeah apparently like yeah that kind of thing is not as uncommon as you think like there's insane legal battles over the rights to like superboy versus superman you know what i mean and like is that a recently uh, did you see that scrat actually got one oh back? yeah i did see that what the fuck this is so weird yeah i guess it's sort of related yeah like the creator of scrat from ice age like the little squirrel guy um she like created a character extremely similar it was like scrat but with a q instead and like i don't know why she apparently just recently was able to win like a lawsuit and she has the intellectual property um honestly actually literally my next note is that i would i would just like to, it says i would like to take a moment that regardless of how you feel about penders personally like you know siding with corporations over creators is pretty cringe and comic creator artists and writers yeah. should be paid more and they should get royalties and they should be able to retain the ownership of their characters maybe not in every situation but like i think it's cool i like the idea of being able to make something and own your characters rather than like most yeah people will just take the rights most of creators pro- get screwed over by like especially like in cartoons and like in comics mm-hmm. they get screwed yeah, over of, by like, the cartoons. publishers and like networks you can't like pitch a show to like adult swim like by the way like imagine justin Rowland, like by the way i'm gonna retain full rights to like rick and morty like the show never would have happened if he was insisting yeah, on that for especially some reason. if you're trying to like break out they like will they have exactly, they usually yes. have like these really like predatory contracts like that but i mean it's it's like the opportunity cost i guess i just wanted to make i just wanted to make it like clear like the the pender's victory was honestly kind of impressive unprecedented and like just it's a strange situation the result mostly archie's incompetence how his archie lawsuit went down and if you thought we were done talking about lawsuits then guess again because that lawsuit probably only happened so that this lawsuit could happen Ken Penders would actually file a lawsuit against Sega and EA Games for alleged copyright infringement. I have never heard about this one. This is why he did the, all that Archie bullshit in the first place. Like, it se- like I, I don't know if he's actually explicitly stated it, but it really seems like one of the main reasons he did that one first. Well, they were sort of running concurrently, but he had to f- settle that one before he could f- proceed on the EA Sega one. Because he wanted to secure the rights to all his old characters because in sep- in September 2008, Bioware released an RPG for the DS entitled Sonic Chronicles, The Dark Brotherhood. Now, <laughs> this game's fucking sucks. There's a whole... <laughs> yes, exactly. There's a whole... I, I have to res- really restrain the Sonic nerd in me, and I'm only going to be mentioning the parts of it that are directly relevant, which are a few plot details. So, in 2001, Penders claimed that the uh, Nocturnus clan and Shade the Echidna from this game were oh. too similar... To his intellectual properties of the Dark Legion and Julie Sue in particular. And he that's why he sued them. He's like, you rip me off or whatever. Um, so let me just briefly explain this. Let me briefly. In the game, the Nocturnus clan, also known as the Dark Brotherhood, is a long-lost race of technologically advanced echidnas who are banished to a dimension called the Twilight Cage by Knuckles' ancestors. <laughs> and a female echidna from this group named Shade defects and teams up with the heroes. And just to refresh your memory, in the comics, the Dark Legion was a race of technologically advanced echidnas who were banished to a dimension called the Twilight Zone by Knuckles' ancestors, and a female echidna from this group named Julie Sue affects and teams up with the heroes. So They did rip them off. You could make a very long, coherent argument about why the events of the game are totally different, and why Shade is a totally different character from Julie Sue, but they have different personalities or whatever, but regardless of how you feel... There are some undeniable similarities in that setting. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is not some frivolous lawsuit. Like, it I've seen some people like completely. They, they took some inspiration from it's it. It's not even remotely outside the realm of possibility. It's clear that while working on the game, the people at Bioware 
did actually look at like weird old Sonic shit. Like, you know, they included SWAT bots who were a main staple from the comics. They technically were created for the Saturday morning AM cartoon. But like if they were willing to be looking at like the Saturday morning AM cartoon for inspiration. It makes perfect sense that they'd be looking at the comics too, right? Like that basically just proves that they were looking at all these weird corners of Sonic lore and media for inspiration in the game. Again, you could argue that like they should be allowed to take any concepts from the comic they want because those concepts should belong to Sega and Archie should have been able to secure them. But the fact of the matter is that those concepts did belong to Ken Penders because of that lawsuit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a, Again, to once again cut a very long legal battle short. This case was actually eventually dismissed, but it's not like as cut and dry as some people seem to think it is. Like it wasn't like the judge summarily ruled like, oh, it wasn't plagiarism or whatever. Penders was actually unable to proceed and forced to limit his legal action due to the statute of limitations based on like how old his comic was or something. Oh. I don't know. Again, I don't know the super fine details, but he has explicitly stated and people have said like it was a statute of limitations thing like. However, if these characters from the Sonic Chronicles, the Dark Brotherhood, like Shade, are ever used again in another new game, then he would have grounds to refile his claim and sue them again. Of course, this will never happen for a number of reasons. One of them being because, a first of all, shitty game. <laughs> the game didn't even do well. And people, nobody wanted a sequel. It wasn't good. And like, even if that somehow was what happened, like, they just would not do it now because of all this legal bullshit, of course. I originally, before I knew any Pender's lore, I was under the imp- impression that he was just some sort of lawsuit, like he's doing a bunch of frivolous bullshit. But the more I looked into his like legal case, like the one area of Pender's I will sort of stick up for him is like, I don't think his legal cases, regardless of like people hate him just because the uh, consequences sort of destroyed the Archie comic. Again, destroyed is a strong term. It was still fine after that, but you know what I mean? It sort of destroyed the original continuity, you know what I mean? And some people were very connected to some of those characters and stuff. So people have like, there's some real... Penderous haters out there who really want to gloss over, they did have some legitimate points in yeah. this uh, case. Again, you could make a coherent argument that it was it, did, it shouldn't have counted as ripping off, and he could have lost or whatever. The point is the case didn't even get settled one way or another, so I don't feel comfortable it's not like, as, saying uh, he definitely should have. It's not as frivolous have. as it may seem. All I'll say is Bioware could have chosen any possible group to be the antagonist besides a race of ancient race of technologically advanced evil echidnas. You know what yeah, I mean? That that specifically seems very. It's Very like they could, have, they could have literally made the game about anything. I mean, the whole point of the, the game is like, also was like, like they don't look exactly the same, but they it's, do look so again, much yeah, similar. exactly. They're not 100%, but it's not, there's not nothing going on there. Again, it's, it's, it's strange. Not like the designs don't look similar itself. It's just the like concept, like there's certain elements of it. Exactly. It, it, it's, and the events of the game aren't that similar to anything that happens in the comic. Exactly. It's more like, like the reasons for Shade defecting and Julie Sue are defecting are totally different. Like the Shade was going to get killed by some guy. Like she was betrayed. Whereas anyway. Julie Sue, <laughs> the soul touch bullshit going on. But um, moving on from all that sort of, um, he, you know, obviously this case sort of just was dead in the water and Penders had to just sort of move on. The Sonic comic continued on in that post-reboot continuity for a while, but eventually, after 290 issues, it was canceled uh, in December 2016. Now, Very honestly, That's 290 like monthly ago. issues is a pretty fucking good run, like, by even by comic book standards. It was sad, but it, was, it wasn't like, you know... Sonic had a pretty good, like, comic, you know what I mean? And some fans like to really blame Penders, like, directly for the comic's cancellation, even though the cancellation was, like, years after his lawsuits or whatever. Although, to be fair, the comic did happen to end just a few months after all that Scott Fuller bullshit, but, like, to, that, didn't even, that didn't even pan out in his favor, so who yeah. knows if that, how much... Ultimately, blame obviously, the, the legal mobile. situation clearly didn't help. Like, it wasn't good that it happened to Archie, but it would be grossly underselling how incompetent Archie was to just blame it all on Penders. You know, it's a bit of a reductive view of the situation. There's probably yeah. a bit more going on than that. I mean, comics as uh, as a whole are kind of a dying industry. That, is, that too, that too, honestly, yeah. And um, just, that is a weird thing, honestly. Yeah, did you look at the sales numbers go down or over, over time? But looking back on it, like the 90s, like it was just this interesting period of time where like these companies were way looser with the, their IPs. Like, you know, Nintendo allowed that live action Super Mario Bros. movie to happen and Sega would allow these insane echidna comics to go on with like no oversight like that none of that could ever happen today so i will always appreciate like the weirdness of those early comics because we're never going to get anything quite like it you know what i mean yeah now just as a quick aside it's not super relevant but back in 2018 a new sonic comic 
be launched by IDW with Ian Flynn as the head. And uh, again, this was even more closer in tone and setting to the comics or than, to the games than the than the post reboot comics were, if if that makes sense. So they still just tell its own stories and has its own interesting original characters. Mm-hmm. And uh, honestly, I think the IW, IDW series is pretty good. So the Sonic comics are doing just fine these days. So even if you hate Penders or whatever for some reason, just just you know. The comics survive, like they survived all that bullshit. I mean, it's a different comic. The Archie comic and the idea of a comic are technically two separate comics, two different, but there's like, a yeah, Sonic comic going on. Whatever. Exactly. Like there's no Freedom Fighters or different the IDW one, and they're probably never gonna no show up again. No Save Your Knuckles, no Holocaust. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Anyways, anyways, now that we're mostly pretty much done talking about all this lawsuit stuff, I actually need to we need to jump back in time to Ken Pender's after his work on the comic after the comic he took some work on odd jobs like i actually spoiled this to bernie but he he worked uh as a storyboard artist on two episodes of king of the hill specifically fucking insane episodes two and five of season 11 i don't even know but i downloaded it or i legally procured that episode of king of the hill and just to check just credit myself and his name at the time exactly it's just a picture i took with my camera so um uh, and so apparently he also did like other like illustration work too. Like he apparently did an ad for Motorola Razor, which was kind of interesting. Oh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I there's like there's so little documentation about his like non Sonic related shit online. Like this is all the stuff that like like that to really kind of dig deep for some of this stuff. But um, another apparently thing that he was commissioned to do was apparently he, I found this on his old website. Uh, Beckett Publications commissioned him to do some covers for the Digimon and Pokemon collector series. Um, he had his fingers in a lot of stuff that I never knew about. Fucking King of the Hill. It's crazy. These are the these are the comics. These are the magazine covers he did for Digimon and Pokemon collectors. Look, look at that Sonic, man. <laughs> you would have never guessed that this guy was behind like an entire like side series of the Archie comics. Like if you look at that Sonic <laughs> Like the other characters look, look at his face. I know, right? It looks so weird. It's so strange. Like I, I, it's just you think he would have gotten like more like the he drew, he's probably drawn Sonic so many times over the years. It's like I don't want to say he's degrading yeah. or getting worse exactly, but like it's just strange. Like it almost seems like he's gotten worse or he's getting worse. That might be true. Honestly, I don't even know. I don't. I, again, I'm not an artist. He's kind of pussyfooting around, but I just don't feel comfortable making coherent like deep art criticisms. But it's strange looking i'd rather just show you the viewer and uh you can decide how you feel about it all i will tell um, you how to think viewer that was just some of the stuff he'd done after working on the comic but i actually need to go back one more time we need to go back to around 2002 and i don't want to get too bogged down on this tangent but there was some interesting drama between him and a guy called ben hurst who was a writer and story editor for the sonic saturday uh sat am tv series and he was attempting to pitch some kind of continuation to the series. And uh, he explains what happened in a post on the alt.fan.sonic-hedgehog news group back in 2005. Oh, shoot. Was this like a fucking Google-like group? Yeah, yeah. Um, this was a... Uh, here, let me... This is basically what Hurst said, and I'm going to just read this out. Okay. I did consult with Deke to see if there was a way to generate some enthusiasm for a feature film to be the third season of Sat AM. I was given the name of a Sega executive and had a most pleasant conversation. She had to go to a meeting, but she said she would like to talk more about the idea. The next day, I got a call from Ken Penders, who had been alerted by his contact in their office that I was interested in getting a Sonic movie going. I generously offered to include him in the effort and told him my strategy. Get Sega to become invested in the idea by hiring us to interview their creative game designers, execs, etc., and see if we could develop a storyline that would fulfill the third season and simultaneously give them creative ideas to develop new games. A win-win situation. Then I called Sega back, but I was shocked when the exec lit into me, telling me people pay us to develop Sonic products, we don't pay them. And then she hung up on me. Obviously, Penders had related my strategy to them in a less than flattering way. Thanks for the knife, Ken. So I gave up. Later, I was informed by friendly fans that Penders had written in his message board or someplace that Ben Hurst doesn't know how movies are made in Hollywood. Hey, Ken, read Adventures in Screenwriting by William Goldman and get some humility. Then he dropped hints that he would be the writer for a big Sonic feature film. That was three years ago. <laughs> okay. Now, as alluded to in that last paragraph, Penders has somewhat disputed Hearst's version of events and, like, you know, he, he, st- he stood by, like, uh, Hearst, you know, he doesn't know how movies are made or whatever in, in Hollywood, so he, 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 that was never even going to be, like, a, a possibility or whatever. So 
I'm going to per- be perfectly honest. I don't really know enough about the inner workings of Hollywood to comment on if that's how movies are made one way or another. And uh, this isn't like an ongoing feud or anything, by the way. Ben Hurst died back in 2010. So the reason I bring this up is because apparently unrelated to this, in 2003, Penders attempted to pitch a Sonic film of his own to, called Sonic Armageddon directly to Sega. He whipped up some concept art and stuff. But the reason I bring it up is because he included a very interesting pitch video. Uh, I think you are aware yeah. of this, Bernie. This is one of the few things I've like seen from Penders. I think I don't know if we can just show yeah, the whole thing. It's only like it. two minutes long. <laughs> you can just watch it. I've seen it a billion times. So do just you want to? No, you want to like let's three, two, one this. We'll we'll live yeah, commentate. Three, two, one, all right. Okay, on go. All right, ready? Three, two, one, go. Obviously, the first nice touch is that there's th- his production company is Floating Island Productions, which is a great Knuckles the Echidna reference. They said it was just a video game, but I knew better. After all, my dad's job was to search for life on other planets. Although many versions of the events he witnessed made their way out into the media. That was just security doing its job. Like who could keep a secret that big, right? Anyway, this is what my dad said really happened. To play a little Pender's defense for us here, this is a pitch video. It's not meant to be a final trailer. I wish this existed at a higher resolution than 240p. You just don't get it. You don't know how movies are made in Hollywood. I forgot how long the title is on screen. It's so funny. Hell yeah. I think that says the planet Mobius 35 blue <laughs> 30 and white something. text on like a white fucking storyboard. And the, it's, just showing, it, it, it's just showing a nice zoom in, okay? Onto Not Whole Village, I believe. I think that's his son voicing Sonic. This this man knows how movies are made in Hollywood. <laughs> that shot with like the clipping. Oh, it's so great. That's that's a real money shot. Again, he, he's like, I'm going to show this to Sega, and then we're going to make a movie. They're going to see this and be like, damn, this is the guy we need to get to do the movie. This, this is man the- knows how movies are made in Hollywood. Right? Okay, so that was no, the whole thing. I just, awesome. uh, I just thought, I love that personally. Floating Island Productions. I thought that was a nice touch. And that, you know, that got me wondering. That got me wondering. Has Floating Island Productions made any other video-related content? And uh, the, I, I was able to find another interesting live-action trailer that uh, I, I'm going to hear your take on this, Bernie. Okay. This is his take on converting The Lost Ones. He wants to, to revive The Lost Ones into a movie format. Let's take a look at this Lost Ones trailer. I, I, I hope that someday he gets this off the ground. So the, the first 40 seconds or so use... Uh, the song from the Watchmen trailer. <laughs> the it's it's actually from the Batman Robin soundtrack. So I think we're not going to be able to sh- play it, unfortunately. Just we'll, imagine we'll just this mute it. with that dramatic music. I think that the music in the second half. Are these actors or is this is stock footage? These are actors, I believe. He like filmed things. I don't know what he filmed for this, but this is there's some good <laughs> shit in here. Trust me. <laughs> that guy just fucking lifted his arms and flew up with this shitty like wing. That was a uh, quite the special effect. <laughs> I guess they couldn't film in a real airport. Look, it's Particle. She's back. <laughs> Dude, like the low frame like rate CGI what is kills this? me. I don't know. I don't know where this is from. If this is original for this, I think it might be, honestly. I love it, dude. I love the low <laughs> frame rate CGI. It gets me every time. It gets me every time, dude. I love that guy. I think that's Dr. Droid. That's not even like a real costume. I know. It was like CGI on top.
not quite what you expected. All right, yeah, the rest of it we can we we're done. Um, yeah, I don't even know. I don't even have any like notes next to that. Just okay. it's kind of so self. You, you sent some. Uh, you sent some tweets from Ken Penders about the. Uh, All right, yeah. Let me just reread these so like you can insert them back when it was relevant. <clears throat> just so we're on the same page. Here's the production I did as a presentation piece to Sega for a proposed Sonic film back in 2003, featuring the main cast. The Sega execs at the time were ready to move forward until the great exec purge took place. Yeah, he's saying this. the only reason this project fell through is because of some, like, corporate bullshit shuffling, not because the pitch was bad. Yeah, do you believe that? I, I don't believe that. That's what that. he says. I don't I, have any other proof to go on here. So, okay, he also says... Yet another urban myth. To this day, I'll never understand why Ben thought Sega would pay him to do a Sonic film. It doesn't work that way. We were lining up funding to license from Sega the, the right to do the film. In retrospect, it was a lost cause because of Sega of Japan. He also said in a tweet, again, this is over a decade after, or about a decade after he died, the problem with Ben Hurst, as well as a lot of creative types, is that he didn't have any business sense. He was simply a writer looking for a paying job instead of being a producer looking to get a project off the ground with a stake in profit participation. I've heard that one for years, and it's time people really apply oh, what, analytical what thinking. What the fuck? Ben Hurst is dead? I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah, he died a decade ago. <laughs> I briefly mentioned that, but it might have slipped by. Damn, he's fucking dead, and he's just ben like. Ben had the industry contacts. Talking. I know he's talking shit about him way after he's dead. That's why this, like, quote unquote feud is so funny to me. Okay. I've heard that one for years, and it's time people really applied analytical thinking to this. Ben had the industry contacts. I had none. If I did have a chance to get something off the ground, it was a Knuckles project with DreamWorks when they contacted me. So he says that at some point he was contacted by like, DreamWorks because they like were interested happened, in making a no thing about his I, Knuckles character. I characters. really doubt that DreamWorks like read the Knuckles comic. They probably just saw, oh, Ken Penders is the one behind the Knuckles like side comic, so I'll contact him. Yeah. His uh, resume is not necessarily that bad. Like, he worked on official Sega stuff. Like, if he was going around pitching stuff, he might be enough to, like, get a meeting or something. I know how it originated. The sad fool actually thought Sega was going to pay us to make a movie. Here I was, working for a comic publisher who paid Sega for the right to produce a comic book, and he believed Sega would pay us? Delusional. Now, he might be right there. And again, that's, what you can tra that's, why, that's why originally you can transition that into the part where I said, uh, I don't know enough about Hollywood to be like, that maybe he's right, but still, the way that this is like a feud after, he's fucking, he's, you know, 10 years yeah, after the fact. Yeah, move on. I guess, I guess other people do bring it up, but... People, okay, to be fair, people are constantly poking the bear on Twitter. People can't just leave this fucking guy alone. They're like constantly like talking shit about him, and again, not that I want to be Pender's defense for us, but like they're constantly getting information wrong so he always feels justified in like correcting yeah, them about that's fair stupid Actually, bullshit you know, about the lawsuits. it is fair to issue that kind of statement but right again i it is like people penders is just responding to people most of the time on twitter he's not always out there making just insane declarations or whatever so all right believe it or not there's one just just one more video project i need to show you from from floating island productions <laughs> apparently in 2010 he filmed an entire movie called the Republic, which is some kind of like politically oh themed thriller. The I'm not Republic. entirely sure. Like IMDb listed as a TV movie, but but the YouTube description of the trailer says it's a, a revolutionary new web series scheduled for debut in early 20, 2011. And to the best of my knowledge, out. it is still unreleased. Yes. Um, but he hasn't like fully given up hope on it here. We got some real Pender's Lost Media here. We got to watch this trailer too. Again, this is the last trailer, although there is one more video after this. I'll show you. Three, two, one, go. Go. He's right for once. This is historic. Really? How did you know that? Hey, everybody. This feels like a fucking Who's porno. Who's with me? Kiki, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Frank, we're here to invite you to join the neighborhood patrol. What's going on? What are you guys doing up so late? There's going to be a whole lot more upset before things <laughs> right? Oh, man. Sir, sir. We got you. Jeez, Chess, you're wearing a gun? Get out of here. Nothing, Fred, please, come on. This is, this is unbelievable. It's unimaginable. No more self-indulgence, boy. Those bombs, they're falling in the valley. The Republic, that... That fucking transition was awesome. Fucking blazing fire and like a stock explosion. I know it's rules. We've been hit with an earthquake, but we didn't feel it. <laughs> I don't know why everything about this trailer gets me. <laughs> the New World Order. Welcome to the, the New, New World, World Order. Order. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> My father. Nothing makes sense. 
world premiere only on the Republic TV. Unfortunately, it would not make that date. Um, the Republic TV sounds like the site that you would go to after you get banned off YouTube for being racist. <laughs> right? It is weird. Um, it is a, such a, such a weird like project or whatever. Now, I mean, it's so weird because clearly this is like I don't want to oversell how bad it is, but it gives me like Tim and Eric like yeah, Neil Green vibes when I'm Neil watching Green it. Like vibes. it's definitely. Um, it's weird though because it's it it has some real actors like that's Sean Young. She was in Blade Runner, and the guy was in like Beastmaster Jeez. or something. It's 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 weird. Now, there, unfortunately, that trailer honestly made the movie look way more entertaining than it actually is. Because, again, the movie's not out, but there's a 12-minute preview of what we're I assume is the opening this. scene of the movie. Oh, we're, not we're watching, watching this. this. I'm going to make Bernie watch. We're watching this. Unfortunately, it's going to be too long to put in the video, so Bernie's going to have to not only watch it, but he's going to have to pick we the best part that he wants this. to use to... <laughs> We're, we got you have to watch at least the first couple minutes right, we'll and then we can the drop it because you, you will get the you will get we'll the vibe the first four minutes. Okay. okay three Ready? two one go this logo is so shitty it's like a png I don't know why of a fucking island it doesn't look like a good floating island yeah it doesn't it just looks weird it's like a weird photo bash of like rocks and oh trees my God. the republic the <laughs> I forgot it opened with this song. Is this is an original song? The Republic. I, I think so. <laughs> By the way, because the people who are listening to this can't see this, it's like fucking like historical photos and like, are these like <laughs> war photos? Lee Harvey also getting assassinated is, over like, yeah, over like a PNG like of, or no, it's like, like an animated gif of some fire yeah. and like, like this like flag yeah, in the background. It's really shittily like cropped fire over an American flag and then like protests like the republic again the trailer and the intro make it seem like it's going to be this epic thriller. agenda that has divided our great country has been eradicated once and for all. We are entering exciting This sounds like a fucking South Park voice. He does have this weird voice. It does sound like a guy from South Park. It's a weirdly accurate call, but it's... It really has like a parody vibe. As one of our greatest presidents said, with a number of new laws going into effect under the various Freedom Acts, most of which do not affect our day-to-day -day lives. On the home front, terrorist bombs continue to ravage <laughs> Chicago and St. Louis. Oh my god, no the acting. Oh man, in the I'm late. I gotta go. The man, into I'm late. I gotta go. Fire gotta go. Go. Oh, 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 hey, Betty, wait, careful, careful, I got no coffee. Bye-bye. Definitely giving some, like, the room vibes for sure. <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> Please make sure the garage door stays closed. <laughs> what the, what the, what's with that shot? Some of you going to fix the water. Couldn't take a shower this morning. What about the water? The water's fine. Petey! You're gonna miss the bus! Petey! I'll be right down, Mom! Jeez! Keep your hands off my stuff. Way to go, zombie land. Why don't you go shave your legs, hairball, and your upper How legs? old are these? Morning. Are they supposed to be? They look like fully like grown Wait. adults. Stop it, they look way too old. The 240p is kind of helping mask it. Mama, catch a bus to Juliana's. No. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they they filmed this whole thing, huh? I believe it's entirely filmed. I'm not 100% sure. This. Okay, okay. I think we're just <laughs> not watching any more of this shit. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, uh, you pretty much have, like, a general vibe for it. If you just want to, like, skip forward yeah, I'll, briefly I'll look and look for at random stuff parts. It's like episode, him at school, him at work. You can find some funny clips to put in the vid, in the pod, or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> that that is some prime, some primo lost media for people to look for. That is so bad. Definitely, yeah. If you're one of those lost media people, I mean, it's not like it was released and then lost, which is what real lost media is. I guess no, I don't think it was ever actually released. released. Like, oh, I guess you're right. I don't know why I had that in my, in my mind. But, like, I don't know. The point is, 
recently Penders has been talking about it on oh, Twitter, really? like not that long ago. Like someone asked, is it canceled or is it still in development? And he asked, said, uh, it's a finished film. I'm just trying to get it out there to a broader audience. I'm thinking of going the film festival <laughs> route and see where that takes me, which please do that, Penders. I'm begging you that to take is, this to film festivals. That so, sounds uh, awesome. Or just sell to DVDs of it. I would buy a DVD Dude, of this. Not be kidding. Like- he needs to do like his own film festival, like a Nathan for you, where it's just his movie right. and like Absolutely. a guy farting. And uh, maybe the Lost Ones trailer, he could get some funding for that. And you can see in that first pick, he's like, uh, here I am directing the great and beautiful Sean Young for a scene from The Republic. Like, I don't know. So he's like, I don't know, reminiscing about this kind of recently. Currently working to get the completed film out for public release. It's um, like 10 years, right? It's been, uh, yeah, it's been over 10 years now. <laughs> Um, well, maybe it'll come out. Although things, Ken Penner's working on a project for a long time and it not coming out. It's sort of a recurring theme we're going to see pop up one more time here. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to, give me one minute. I'm going to go to the bathroom and get okay. some more uh, water. Stop the recording, by the way, just so we can save it. And then we'll. So we'll be in two parts. Okay. Okay. I'm stopping my audacity. Absolutely. We will lose so much of it. Okay. I'm stopping my audacity recording right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Ken Penders episode, episode three, part two. We didn't originally have it planned to be split up into two parts, but it actually kind of ended up working out because it ended up being really long, longer than I was expecting. So this part shouldn't be quite as long yeah, as that was, the first one. That was the longest damn bathroom break I've ever been witness to. Yeah. We were gone for like six months. Yeah, we, we, this part of the joke doesn't even make any sense because we didn't release the first part of the episode to people. So it's not like <laughs> they've been waiting. But yeah, uh, we're going to get back into the thick of things really quick. But just before then uh it's worth mentioning that we accidentally ended up taking a little bit of a break between well it's a little more complicated which is why i don't want to go into it because we actually originally recorded this whole thing but then the last like 40 minutes got chopped off and and then then my computer got corrupted we were going to re-record it right away but then all we'll put it off next month we'll put it off next anyways the point is we recorded part one back in february now it's like november so if we do anything like repeating stuff from part one cut us a little slack is all i'm going to say but but it kind of worked out because then some like immediately after we recorded that some stuff happened with Ken that we can and uh, there's a little bit to so. go over at the end but don't worry it's not it's nothing too major it's not like some epic plot twist revelation that happened in the last few months regarding Penders and uh, the other apology I was going to get out that was actually part of the original recording which is that uh, this has kind of been a visual heavy podcast I know the whole point of a podcast is you're supposed to be able to just listen to it but uh, to get the full experience here you're probably gonna need to throw this up on like a second monitor or something and look over when we talk about comic pages or whatnot you know so in the future we'll try to be more audio friendly yeah we'll try to and even this time around We'll try to describe things a little Oh, better. yeah. We'll try and describe what's on screen, so to speak. But there's only so much we can do with our words. Some things truly need to be witnessed. You need to behold them with your own eyes. We can never do it justice. And I, <laughs> it sounds hyperbo- like, like hyperbole, but I really do mean that. Some of Ken's art, I don't think I could properly describe it. You kind of need to see it. Anyways, um, yeah. <laughs> so if you know anything about modern Ken Penders, this is the kind of what we've been leading up to this entire time is that he is currently working on his own comic, the Laura Sue comic, which is, uh, it's actually known as the Laura Sue Chronicles. And it's basically sort of his magnum opus. Like it's going to be his sort of life's work. I would say it's, it's set out to be an ambitious seven book saga and, uh, not like a monthly comic series. It's going to be like a series of large graphic novels. I believe he said volume one is aiming to be around 160 pages or so. It's essentially a continuation of his Mobius 25 years later storyline that he wanted to tell in the Sonic comics. This is starring Laura Sue as the protagonist. Here's a, uh, a direct quote from Penders. He says, uh, I look at the Lara Sue Chronicles as my effort to finish what I began. Here's this world I had to create for Sonic and Knuckles to play in. A world so rich, they're not even really necessary to complete the story. People may disagree because of my inclu- <laughs> the inclusion of my character, Knox, but that was to allow a tighter connection to what came before for longtime readers. I couldn't leave them hanging after all this time, which is, um, yeah, there's a character that's, he's not legally allowed to be Knuckles, but he's called the Praetorian, and uh, he's basically just Knuckles with like a little Legally iPad. distinct knuckles. slightly le- i mean he looks almost identical if, if you scroll down a bit you'll see he's uh he's basically just knuckles but he goes by the name Knox, like k apostrophe n-o-x <laughs> i like that he has to like clarify that it's just fan service it's like he doesn't actually give a fuck i know it's, it's just funny but... to me that he's like yeah he's really he sort of goes at what i was saying earlier which is that he never really particularly cared about sonic or knuckles it's more about this world he's created and he's interested in telling stories about this is actually not released yet. Nobody can, you can't just go buy the Laura Sue Chronicles and read it. So it's kind of hard to offer a, you know, comprehensive critique. But we can look at the bits and pieces of like art and pages that he's happened to release and what he said about it in interviews. Like he has given 
a pretty detailed like seven book summary of what he intends for it to be and like it's going to feature all sorts of characters from like you know the, the sonic comics that he now owns um hold on let me bring this up here as you can see at the very top part you can see the general character designs are they're definitely like the echidnas from the sonic uh comic and the knuckles comic but technically they are not echidnas they are a distinct race called echidnas they're like aliens or something they're do they even have fur or did that just like skin yeah it looks very like flesh tendrils coming out of their head i i'm not 100 percent sure if he's ever clarified whether that's supposed to be covered in fur if they're just they're now just aliens because as you can see in some of these designs there's like hair on top of the the you know the the dreadlocks is what people usually call knuckles is like his locks but again it's sort of implied that they're hair whole sonic universe will like what what is and isn't hair is sometimes a little confusing especially since a lot of the times the characters just look like they're like plastic toys or whatever you know what i mean yeah i guess that's just like a furry thing but I don't think his characters are furries, though. Speaking of plastic toys, uh, some of the more famous Lara Sue promotional images are these 3D renders he had commissioned by an artist called Kevin Knowles, and uh, they're they're usually like like some of the most heavily memed on pieces of Lara Sue. Wait, those are 3D? Well, these uh, if you scroll down under to underneath like the Superman image and stuff. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You see him now. These are kind of future. They. I don't know. I feel bad. I, you know, I'm sure this person does fine work otherwise. Right. But. That's what I was going to say. I want to emphasize. These are just uh, 3D renders he has used to promote it, but these they're not like actually... Xavier Renegade Evil <laughs> characters. They are what extremely strange looking. Like, the character designs on their own are very strange looking in Pender's art, but then trying to translate them to a 3D style. But some of these taglines crack me up. Like, new day, new style, same diva isness, which is like, what, what does that even mean, <laughs> Ken? You know, like diva, <laughs> devious. I, I don't know what that means, really, but it's like a fucking that. That's the kind of wordplay you'd find in like a gaming ad in like a magazine, right? I guess maybe that's the aesthetic he's going for. <laughs> Are these characters? Because who who is the deviousness, diviousness character? Because I think what's especially disturbing is just like you know when you when you're making a 3D model, you have to decide how to texture everything. So this character just has like fully rendered like human hair, but yeah, all the tendrils are just skin. And then they have like realistic eyelashes and teeth. And it's like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, something about the like, it's not like super hyper realistic, but Ken's art is just more detailed than you would really expect or want with these kinds of strange furry characters. Yeah, it's like vaguely more anthropomorphic than like the Sonic characters, like vaguely more human. And it just looks really gross. And I... I don't know. It's weird because he'll he's the style has sort of changed and combined over times. Like, okay, so here some of the earliest promo images looked more like this, where it's kind of just sort of like you know, it's it's a bizarre. very bizarre character design. But yeah, as it, as it's gone on over time, there is a strange thing where Ken has like a legal light, like he's a responsibility to make them look visually distinct from you know Sonic characters, so that there couldn't be any sort of confusion in the marketplace. You know, he's definitely very aware of that. Yeah. So this this art is um the first actual like kind of design for Laura Sue like that we know of. Well, it's funny because she they're adapting sort of her take from the comics because they had to take a character that existed. Uh, actually, he did a signed print. This isn't like a canon image, but like this is showing how she looked sort of in the original versus how she looks on the uh, new ones. Because yeah, exactly. See, he can't just he can't just draw he can't just draw uh, like Sonic OCs looking like red and exactly like Knuckles. That's sort of what I was saying earlier with his Knuckles stand-in OC. He has to do it he like. He's not, like, he's aware that they look very different, but, like, the question is, do they look good? And uh, most people do not seem to find this particularly appealing of an art style. Let's put it that way. I don't really consider it my job to point point here, like, look how bad it looks. I just want to show you guys, and you can sort of decide, you know, what you think yeah, I just, of I this I want to describe this, because for, for the viewers who can't see this, like, it began as, like, literally, you know, just a knuck, like an echidna. And then there's there's even art of Laura Sue, where it kind of looks like the, uh, she has, like, like the kind of circular head in some of the animated ones, like the Western animated shows they did. And then it just slowly became more like alien-like and like weird. Right. Like some shit out of like like a sci-fi movie. It looks very different. Yeah, well, he definitely has like a sort of interest with sci-fi. Like there's always been a sci-fi bent to a lot of the Sonic stuff. So it sort of makes sense that he's leaning into that angle. But it does just, it looks so weird. Like, you know, he's like stretching like the limits of it. And almost it feels like, you know, it's like, why didn't he just make something completely original? But I guess it's sort of, you know, he wants to, he spent so much time working on this world or whatever. So he figures he might, he wants to just keep, keep chugging along, keep working at it. Even though it's like completely changed, not mediums exactly, but like it's gone from like one legal, like spin-off of a video game in a comic form to just a completely original thing. It would be very confusing for like a new fan of Penders, I feel like. 
like, yeah, you know, why doesn't he just, I guess people wouldn't even pay attention to it probably, but you would think that if he's fully no holds barred, he could just take all the good ideas he has and just put put them onto like an original, wholly original character with no restriction. There's something interesting to me about how it's sort of, sort of like, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like he, it's like he's had so many bad experiences dealing with like, you know, Sega and Archie. It's like, why would you even, it's like almost weird to like, why would you even want to keep using these characters, you know? But then it's like, another thing, he spent, he, like, he, it's, he it's won them. They were hard won for. in court, you know, he earned the rights to these characters and he doesn't want to let them go. He's very attached to them. That's true too. He must've spent, I don't know how much money he spent, but that must've <laughs> So and he has fun. to, yeah, he has to justify it to himself, like, it's worth it to have these characters because I'm going to tell my story with them. Um, yeah, you were asking earlier, so, like, in the Sonic comic, this is what uh, the character, like, Lian Da looks like. But then, yeah, her 3D render, promotional. Pretty cool design, honestly. But, yeah, this I is like what, this how design. she's interpreted in the uh, the promotional images. Oh, my, they, that's, that's who that is? Okay. That's the same character. That's what I was trying to say. That's why it's strange, right? Like, that is... there's not a lot of continuity. <laughs> whereas, like, in, like, you know, Knuckles, whereas that's his 3D so version... Again, the you can, 3D you can, version, you know, they look like those images of like the goofy cosplayers. Dude, they, I, I don't know, they literally do have like cosplayer, like furry outfit energy. And, you know, I'm not even throwing shade at that, but just like, you know, you can just sort of see it's like a mascot costume or something. It's strange. Yeah, the little that, hands like, get me. I don't know what. The James Cameron, like avatar, like energy. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Not like in terms of quality, just like the species. I actually don't know what they're called. But, but yeah, it's gross. <laughs> this is actually like what Penders is out. He goes to conventions and he's like, well, he doesn't just sell. Uh, I mean, because obviously I was going to say he can't sell, you know, this because it's not out yet, as I already explained. But he'll like sell old comic prints of like Sonic and sign them and stuff. That's cool, at least, you know, helping the fans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like I said, I, I really wish I could have found the time to get this uh, sweet Echidnia's shirt that you can see has the, the, the proper spelling of this alien species. Echidnia's. Unfortunately, uh, I actually was like, oh, I would love to get one of these, but apparently he sold his last one recently at a con. So if you have one of these shirts out there, hit me up. I might be interested in purchasing it at a premium price. How much How much money are you willing to pay for this? Uh, let's, I'll, I'll leave that between me and the person that I'm bidding it on with. You know, I'm not going to I don't want to put a price out there and get people's hopes up too much. I will make sure. I will like match your price. <laughs> You're just gonna sure that that buy it. That cost goes up into the to hundreds. deprive me of it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> The person who purchased it loved the app and can't wait for its release. You, you have to wonder, is that, that's like a tweet that was, he was talking about uh, the last person who bought his shirt. And it's just, I wonder if that was true or if there's somebody spinning bullshit. It's like, yeah, man, I can't fucking wait for the app. Does Ken Penders have real fans out there? I have no idea. I honestly, I, I, I don't, I think he has some people who like, you know, he has fans from people who just liked the old Sonic comic, so, you know, they like him and they support him, even though... I don't, I'm trying to sort of, like, does Ken Penders have fans? He definitely has some fans in, like, Defenders and White Knights or whatever. Are there, like, real Lara Sue Chronicles fans? I, that, I just can't imagine in my mind that exists. Like, it, possibly? Ken Penders is, like, the biggest super fan of his own work, so he's... In his mind, it's clearly super popular, but I just... I don't think... Uh, I don't I don't know how much demand there is out there for this exact, like, continuation of a subplot in a cancelled Archie Sonic comic book, you know, from, like, decades ago. Yeah. People are just... are not that interested in it, I think. I don't know how much demand there is there. It's funny because there's already been some controversy based on just pages he's posted online, even though, again, as I said, it's not out yet. So, like, there was this one page he posted where the uh there's a character whose likeness looks very similar to anthony mackie in real life and people were rightfully kind of confused about this yeah wait like viewers can't see this but in it's like this astronaut flying through space but in inside the helmet is like this photorealistic like painting or something it looks like a photo that was like heavily filtered and kind of painted over of anthony mackie and it's like, uh, I don't know, I'm not, again, I'm not some copyright expert, but I think there's like rules about using people's likeness in your things just to profit or whatever. Yeah, you can't, I don't think you can just do that. It's not like he denied it. It's not like people are like, hey, what is this? He's like, oh, uh, it's like, why are you using Anthony Mackie's face? He says, simple. I didn't want to depict a generic black guy. So it's like, again, I don't understand why does that give you the exact rights to use someone's face? So again, multiple people tried talking to him about this. Like, uh, so someone was like, uh, yeah, you didn't exactly get the permission for his likeness to be used, did you? So he, his response, I don't understand this to this day. He says, maybe he'll play the character in the film version if there is one. I get that'd be nice and all, but I worried you're violating his rights or the image owner by tracing it. If I did a portrait of you while you watch me, would you call that tracing? I did portraits of real people 
people when I was in Artist Alley at Comic Con, people watched and took note of, and pics of me doing it. There's no tracing there either. So it's again, it's not the same. But it is funny because like I know like sometimes things like that happen. Like Simon Pegg's likeness was sort of used for a character in The Boys, but again, I, I it's like one thing to just do without people's permission. And I don't know, it's strange. So it's sort of a gray area. Like it's just kind of a funny thing to do. I'll say this, you know, n- not knocking anyone, but uh, a lot of a lot of Ken Penders' art is uh, clearly photo moshed, where he uses a lot of stock images and kind of puts them together into the uh, cuts them out and puts them together to make the backgrounds and environments and it's like that's fine i think like you can make that look good but the way he does it i don't think it like blends in well and that's a problem too with using the, like this just actual actor's likeness without their permission because it doesn't blend in well anyways like <laughs> it just stands out like a like a sore thumb and like for him to then argue like well it's not tracing it's like i don't know i I could totally believe that you just carried the same philosophy you do for the backgrounds and just pasted his face in and then slightly altered the lighting and everything, you know, the colors. Right. Like, it's kind of what it looks like. Like, you airbrushed over it. But Like, I know I'm the last person to be shitting on someone's creative output for not being consistent enough, but, you know, it's been literally, like, years and years, and we're still waiting on the first book. And again, this is supposed to be, like, a seven-book saga. We've been just waiting. And he keeps getting sidetracked with things, like, he has to develop an app. Like, he can't just have, the like, the comic or whatever. He needs to develop an app for... For the comic so people can you know download it and there's like interesting ideas he has in there like he wants to do like motion pages or whatever but it's kind of strange that you know so much priority is being placed on these like external things including like random shit like like again interesting ideas like oh you know using the app you can just select a language and view the comic in any language but he's also like ah, oh, the world building <laughs> in continues the, in the Lara Sue Chronicles one will be able to select the language. language as an option it's like why is this uh what's the point of that I leave it to the fans to decide cipher and figure out pronunciation after i figure out the ground rules what is this language is that even public like what his language is uh yeah he has like some you know i wish i had a picture on me and if i can find it i'll link it later but like yeah there's like you know some gibberish type language where you can like map on characters or something i'm not 100 percent sure exactly the you know i'm not a linguistic expert but uh you said um you said that this the first issue is 160 pages. That's the plan, and again, I don't I I I have no idea how much he actually has done, but he's released quite a few test pages or whatever. I'll say this: that is an insane like workload. Like doing that alone, because I don't know how many people he has helping him. Is it is it completely him? He's just solo. I believe he is entirely in charge of art and writing. Like yeah, to my knowledge, it's a solo project. Which again, yeah, that is admirable. Yeah, but not gonna knock the ambition, but. That is insane. Like it. That is that is so fucking difficult. I mean, because like, say like you're you're finishing ten pages a month. Like that's pretty unrealistic. But let's say you're finishing ten pages a month at minimum. That's still like if you worked nonstop. You're like you're still that's still gonna take you like almost two years, probably like, one and a half years. And add on to that like an app, and that you're. You're also doing convention appearances. You're traveling all the time, so you can't be working on it then. You have to take care of your family. That's pretty fucking insane. I don't. I wouldn't. I don't know why he's adding more onto that, like focusing on the motion comic. Right. Yeah. So for example of that here, I've attached a little video where you can see like he has some text to speech voices filling in, but I believe the final version is intended to have some voice acting. Success before it lived off. So I bring Lars in. She's but like uh, I believe if you go to his booth at like a convention, he will like have this app or whatever running on like a iPad or something. You are right. Sensors are picking up four live signs on board. You know, I don't really get what the point of this app is, though. Because, like, does your experience really improve by having the panels very slowly fade in? Like, like... Yeah, honestly, it is kind of strange, right? Like, it feels like this is the kind of thing you should worry about when your thing is totally done or whatever. Yeah, it's like a fun thing for the fans, I mean. Because that may, that must make it harder, because now he's thinking every single panel has to be compatible with the motion comic, right? Like, right. Oh, God. I believe he's also motion comicifying uh, a lot of the older, relevant Archie comic stories. I'm not 100% sure. Like, does he, he does not have the rights to those. No way. The, I don't think he has the rights to like, sell them on his app, so I don't know what he's doing. But, like, yeah, he, he was in, very interested in this app, like angle for a long time and I, th- I mean i think he still is working on it to some degree uh but it's not like publicly available to download like i said so we'll just have to wait and see making like a motion comic app i think is like you know not to be mean but it's like what an old person thinks adapting to the times is right that and like i guess making nfts or whatever oh i remember now another part of the app was he intended to have really long detailed character bios included 
Like, uh, <laughs> let me see if I can find. Holy shit! <laughs> the Lara Sue bio. The known family section yeah. that goes into like the maternal great 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 grandfather whereabouts unknown. Like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you remember from part one, there was a bit of an obsession with like lineage shown in the comics for Knuckles or whatever, and now it's like, yeah, you like it's just really funny to me that like there's like all these little like like abilities location and then there's uh the known family which is not only just like oh Damn. here's your mother and father Aww. it's like here's a father and mother and uh lock is dead maternal maternal grandfather whereabouts unknown and then there's like great 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 paternal grandfather twin brother to edmund and then there's like just so many like <laughs> you know <laughs> it, it, it's presenting it in this form where you have to have like five greats in pr- in parentheses after the name. It's like it can't possibly be the most efficient way. Will these characters ever appear in the story? Like, are they relevant at all? Like, for most of these, like, at what point do I need to know their paternal fifth great grandfather? <laughs> yeah, it's very peculiar. I don't know. Like, it, even in the in the Knuckles comic, like most of those guys didn't show up, or if they did, it was like in a flashback for like one panel, you know. So, but uh, I guess it's just sort of about trying to have some sort of world build- building aspect where it's like, you know, it seems more legit if you can trace their bloodline back through all these characters. But like, it's one thing to just make a name. It's, it's another to actually make an entirely new character. You know what I mean? I like Canox, aka by nickname acquired as a young lad due to the unusual bone structure of his hands. You know, alluding to Knuckles, but he can't say it. That rules. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. There's a lot of just like good little like tidbits you can find in here. It's like just it, things about how it's funny because like the Knuckles like comics are canon, but they can't be too directly referenced. And like some of it, I think technically might be different because again, they're, they're not echidnas, they're echidnas. These, uh, it's funny because like there were bios not too dissimilar to this in the uh, Knuckles comic, but they were a little, so it's like this is sort of a thing that's been going back all the way back to, you know, the 90s. See, I like. I like these designs. They're they're super of their time, but I actually really like these. Like not the drawing in the bottom right on this page, right. where it kind of looks. They kind of have like those weird faces and anime eyes. But the drawing on the left is just this echidna with like like what what would you call that hairstyle? I'm I'm not even sure. But just like these like this massive like 80s hairstyle, and then like s- like cybernetic like attachments to their their uh, frills, and like this just looks fucking. As you can see, they they definitely had more of like an, an anthropomorphic body with like the larger the big head, but also the big hands and sort of smaller overall size. Whereas the final design that Ken is going with is a pretty humanoid like body shape, just with a large head with weird tentacles coming out of it. So it just looks strange. And again, you know, th- these are just like slightly tweaked just enough. Where where it looks kind of strange. He did give he did make one change that maybe some Sonic fans will appreciate and so that they have they have thighs now. And no more noodle legs. Yeah, it's always been sort of weird how yeah, you know, he's been trying to give like musculature and stuff to these sort of rubber hose looking uh, <laughs> you know, stupid dumb animal characters. Yeah, these rubber hose looking cartoon characters, which is like, you know, I'm sure that can look fine, but he doesn't know how to do it. Right. They look too human. And it's, I mean, I guess part of that's because he has to make them legally distinct, but I don't know. It just looks so weird. This is the alien direction. I don't know if that was the move, but I, I guess I don't know what what move you could do. Like, what direction could you take where you keep like you keep the frills, you keep the uh, the fucking fuck. What what is the terminology? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, all the echidnas they have them. Oh, the dreads or whatever. Yeah, the dreads. Like you keep the dreads, and uh, but they're not echidnas. Like what? What? I guess the only possible way you could do that is that they're aliens and they're tendrils. But it's, it, I, don't, I don't know. It looks looks really creepy. They look like sci-fi monsters. Maybe maybe if they didn't have the also freakishly large bug eyes, they'd look a little less creepy. <laughs> yeah, there's something weirdly like yeah, they it's definitely sort of it's not quite the uncanny valley, but he's make he's made the furry anthro characters too human and not furry enough. You either got to go human or got to go furry. Not this like it's not even quite like a furry suit because even those have like more exaggerated features and whatnot. Whereas yeah, the giant eyeballs on the like normal looking alien or whatever kind of looks weird. So, in a move that probably wouldn't surprise anyone, uh, you know, back when this this was still a hot craze. Ken decided it would be a good idea to try and maybe monetize his world by using NFTs. <laughs> it's, um, I guess this was really when people were going nuts about them because he had some very, like, optimistic, like, hopes of what they were going to go for. Oh, my God. He was, he was pricing them at 100000 His initial <laughs> NFT said he wanted to sell them for 100 k each. It's, Holy um, shit. 
It's uh, if you look at the ratio on these tweets too. It again, it almost feels like he des- deliberately put this out there to get as much negative attention as possible because he's like eighty even likes like, to nine hundred quote retweets and things like saying Julie Sue, aka Shade, and Green Knuckles. I don't know. <laughs> I, I like that. Um, I spent the evening with my family setting up the means to release my work as an NFT collection after discussing the pros and cons of the whole venture very thoroughly. So like. With his family? Yeah, I guess he was having a family meeting about it. For, I don't know how many of these he actually, if he ever, I don't know if he ever actually sold them. I don't believe so. And uh, this is what they were planned to look like, at least the Julie Sue one, which again is part shade, which is this very strange insistence he has that he believes he owns the copyright to shade, even though, first of all, first and foremost, he didn't, the, the, the EA lawsuit was not settled in his favor. He did not win some sort of like summary, like, oh yeah, you actually got it. So he just has decided that, well, because in his mind, you know, shade and the Dark Chronicles ripped him off and like, oh, this character is clearly ripping off Julie Sue, therefore, you know, she just is Julie Sue, therefore I own her. And it's very weird, like, he has to insist on this being true and people are like, you didn't actually like, even if she was a ripoff of your character, you did not design Shade, so like, why do you think it's okay to <laughs> sell art or whatever? Of, yeah, or, or, or like, 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 not that he's just selling art of her, because you can sell art of things, but like, he claims specific ownership over Shade and he's like gone to extreme lengths to be like, like, retroactively add it into continuity where he's like, I'm resolving a certain issue in the Laura Sue Chronicles. I'm definitely establishing that Shade was Julie Sue's deep cover name on assignments to meet meeting Canucks. And yes, she did wear the armor depicted in Sonic Chronicle games. And it's like, that does, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, and you know, this is actually where it becomes interesting. Pender's, what if Pender's actually like gets away with it? Because I think there's a, there's some, some issue I think with copyright where if you don't enforce your copyright, you can actually lose it. So right. if they I don't, don't know. come after him, like, some people, you might, you might be legally safe after a few years. I have no well, idea. I, I, that's the weird thing is like, uh, nobody, Sega doesn't want to do anything with shade. Like, like the first of all, the Sonic Chronicles games bombed, but second of all, it's just like, they have no interest in it. Now, recently a sonic art book came out that for like first time in like forever practically and i did mention like this was a list of games this was basically like a wikipedia listing it wasn't like we're using shade against like hey this game came out and shade was in it and some people took this as like a w over pender it's like ha huh, sega acknowledged shade in the sonic chronicles but like penders does sort of have a point where he's like you know let's see him put shade in a game or something where it really matters like that's gonna happen in the lifetime or, or, or next uh and as you can see in the bottom of that previous image where he's like you know i will do whatever t- steps i feel necessary protecting my interests where the laura sue chronicles are concerned and so yeah, this really does feel like he's like, you know, like I don't, why would he if he even cared enough to include this thing that he didn't create in his thing? It really does sort of feel like he's just trying to prove. And uh, as you can see in that, that second image yeah. I showed. Well, he's kind of spinning them not caring about this character at all because the game was a bomb and he, you know, I guess also because he made a bunch of issues for them. He's kind of spinning that into, well, I guess I won again. It's like, okay, well, I, just, I think they just don't care what you do. I think, I think they probably regard you on the same level as the millions of other fan art at this point in regards to shade but who knows maybe maybe they'll maybe i'll eat those words when they like sue him <laughs> over the rights of shade yeah you it's really funny to I- preserve that character <laughs> He, I think he thinks he's, like, strengthening his argument or whatever by, like, you know, putting this out there. But I don't really think anyone else cares. He's just, like, he's, like, the only one who's, like, ready and willing to go to court over Shade, whereas no one else cares. You know what I mean? Yeah, which is weird because he didn't he didn't make that character, right? It was just based on... Yeah, he straight up did not design that armor. And the character, again, is different. There's definitely elements of similarity with the overall scenario to the point where he has, like, a reason to, you know, think that, they, you know, they may have ripped him off. But then just because someone rips you off doesn't mean you own what they made, you know? It's just That's not that simple. It's, it's strange, do, yeah. It's just his wonder, interpretation what, what of the, it. What is the copyright of that? It's interesting. But mm-hmm. I, I, at a certain point, though, I do wonder, like, why he didn't just design his own version of that right why didn't yeah. he just prove he could if i was penders and i was so certain that they needed my ideas why wouldn't i just make something better you know that's why i'm like version of it yeah this, that's why it feels to me like some sort of weird peacocking thing where he's like i i can do this i have to do this and i'm gonna do it here's some just yeah. more miscellaneous <laughs> random things there's a funny picture of him uh meeting takashi izuka at a convention hold on <laughs> he's actually he's like literally like soy facing that's crazy <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I mean, people would assume there'd be some sort of bad blood, but like they're just two adults and then, you know, they just talked about, they just made some small talk and then it wasn't like no big deal or whatever. I mean, it's just kind of funny that like the head of Sonic Team and this infamous person in the Sonic fandom ever met, honestly. And I, I don't know, there's just something funny to me about Penders having like that 3D stand or the, you know, just the cardboard cutout rather of the, you know, 3D model. <laughs> yeah. 
I was I noticed that it kind of it kind of looks better like as a cutout stand because again it reminds me of like a gaming like a, a 90s 3D render or no, mm-hmm. 90s, like early 2000s like 3D render from, like, right <laughs> like a gaming magazine like I guess I can see that if that was what he was going for but I, I don't know if he was although I, I don't know yeah but he's clearly proud of it him getting to meet getting to meet him you know that's really uh really sets in that he lives the dream of every sonic fan and he got away with it it is funny to think about uh like he does have a sort of an interesting relationship with sonic where he's not sort of you know adversarial necessarily but he's sort of has a contentious relationship with the fan base but it's also sort of like the thing he's most well known for so he has to lean into it it's a means to an end right but like for most people like sonic fans like he's like what he got to do is just legendary you know imagine getting exactly people would kill for the opportunity to officially like write and do sonic like the main person pushing these storylines for sonic and like even getting to win back your characters and like that's in, like that's pretty fucking insane and he just doesn't give a fuck to to that extent like to him sonic again is just a means to an end a means to tell the story he actually wants to tell right there wasn't much attention until he started working on sonic this tweet i always thought was kind of interesting uh the part that some people get confused with my relevancy to the sonic franchise which i really have no say in that's something the fans determine i just know that when i die that sonic will be mentioned in my obituary i'll never escape the little blue guy that's um that's actually you know a pretty succinct way to put it you know i'll give right. him that yeah that's true. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, it's uh, just kind of interesting to think about. It's funny. Another funny thing about just being, having worked on these official things is sometimes people will just ask him like, hey, what was, you know, what was this like in, in Knothole in Sonic's world? And he'll just give some crazy ass answer. Like, <laughs> speaking of which, I've been tempted to ask Ken Penders how Mobians reproduce, but I've been too nervous to ask. And he says, just how you think. They even have abortions and eat their young depending on the circumstances, <laughs> which is like, <laughs> what the fuck? That is such a horrifically <laughs> weird thing to tweet out. What the fuck? <laughs> Wait, yeah. Because <laughs> again, you know, they're animal characters, which animals eat their young, but they're also supposed to be sentient and like human intelligence. So it's just kind of, it's just as funny that like, Yo, these are the kinds of factoids you can get out of him. Jesus. There's a universe, there's a timeline where Locke just fucking ate Knuckles as a baby. Mm. And that's the end of that. <laughs> So here's another weird little fun little thing that happened, which is that uh, he sometimes he would do like he did like a he did like a thing where he offered a free drawing to someone and he picked their name out of the bowl. And then so I just want to set this up first that that he (laughs) did not choose to draw this image, but someone requested of him to do Robotnik tickling. (laughs) And it uh, it's just kind of funny. That what the he was willing fuck to do this, this art. As far as, I don't think he even like was able to like comprehend that this is like some kind of like fetish art or whatever. I don't know why his take <laughs> is, is just so funny to me. Fucking nasty. Part of me <laughs> looks at the drawing as political commentary. Robotnik degrading Leon Daw as Trump did to Hillary. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> He always will has to tie in his own weird like life experiences and stuff to whenever he's commenting on like a public like a matter of like, you know, well, here, let me just present this tweet without context. Uh, I remember all the people who claimed I had no case when I stated I owned the copyrights to all my Sonic work. In the end, I presented the evidence that backed up my claims. Tara Reid has yet to present anything to back up her (laughs) accusations against Joe Biden. Jeez. (laughs) I'm excited. You know, the upcoming election. Excited to see what what pender spits out next yeah he definitely spits political fire not just you know baby boomer generic boilerplate lib takes all day but it's fine (laughs) i guess i guess abortion was just on his mind when someone asked him about procreation (laughs) (laughs) exactly so he was imagining hillary getting tickled by trump like tied down he's just trying to view it as some kind of political (laughs) thing i guess i don't know because the image is if you didn't know it was a fetish thing, like think about this image. Like he has um who who is this character? Fucking Lian Da tied down with her shoes off, getting tickled by like Robotnik. This is like he was thinking of Hillary Clinton when he drew this. Like it's kind of strange. Um also I forgot I, I couldn't find this earlier, but I just found it. Uh you're asking if like there exists any proof of this so called Echidnia language. And apparently this is what it's gonna look like. Again, yes, you can see it's uh he did it on some of the older uh Mobius twenty five years oh, later. Oh, this is so this is actually from the old comic. 
Yeah, exactly. Wait, so you just had to, like, translate this if you wanted to read these panels? Well, I don't know, understand what the point is, because he's obviously offering it in English. Like, it's one thing when you create a fake language like this, and obviously the main thing you do is, like, you put in the background of some shots as an Easter egg and let the diehard super fans, you know, translate it out. But it's like, why would you, like, he's, like, no one's going to learn it should ease just to read this one comic. It's not even like Klingon, where there's a whole, like, subculture and all this other crazy bullshit well, you can get into. He's trying to make the next Klingon, see? He's, I guess he's trying to make it. That's what, again, in his mind, he's creating something of that magnitude you'll see oh i, I will see don't worry in, in like five years we'll all be speaking a chidnian definitely a chidnianese i don't remember <laughs> So let's uh, get back to some of the things. So, you know, as I was saying earlier, people would ask him questions on uh, Twitter. You know what I mean? It's about the original Sonic comic. So I, I briefly mentioned there's, there was this character named uh, Jeffrey St. John, who was like a skunk sort of secret agent character. And a weird thing about this character is like he ended up kissing Sally like a lot of times. Like it was kind of weird. I don't know. It's just sort of a recurring thing that happened, which is kind of funny because he's supposed to be Sonic's girlfriend or whatever. And yes, this is a character he won the rights to from uh, Archie and will be appearing in uh, the Lara Sue Chronicles. Why is he brought back? Yeah, he's not even really that important of a character in the original comic, so it just feels like he has a, a somewhat recognizable character from the thing. But one day he tweeted out something very peculiar, which is, uh, the one story I couldn't tell was Sally losing her virginity to Jeffrey. Sonic may be fast, but <laughs> Jeffrey was way faster on the draw in that department. And so... Uh, First of all, that's weird on a million levels on its own thing, just to be like, oh yeah, by the way, my character totally slept with her first. And then another weird thing is that people immediately latched on to, which is that Jeffrey, the ages aren't like explicitly listed, but Sally is supposed to be like 16 and Jeffrey is in his early to mid 20s. And so he got very defensive about this, saying stuff like, uh, Sally may be 16 in human years, but 32 in squirrel years. Your arguments Aww. thus become irrelevant due to a legitimate storytelling point. I could go into why this knowledge hasn't previously been revealed, but I'm saving that for an actual story. And then then, uh, you know, if people expect him to like back down or something. No, he was just doubling down. He's like, well, uh, the legal age he is in Utah this. is 16 and your state, a, six, a 16 year old Sally could certainly get it on with a 20 year old Jeffrey. <laughs> I guess you need to lobby your state's politicians to change the law. And again, people are like, like, uh, no, Jesus. you can't. It's only consent if they're around the same age, whatever. And he's like, no, go read the law in the state of Utah, which is what we're talking about here. They have what is known as this Romeo and Juliet law. A female 16, 18 can Utah? legally engage in consensual sex with a man who's less than 10 years her senior. So Jeffrey could be 25 and be legal. So again, it's always sus when someone starts breaking out encyclopedic knowledge of uh, age of consent laws. Yeah, but... especially when this doesn't take place in fucking like Utah. Again, and this is a story point that never even actually happened in the comments. He's like, oh, by the way, this happened after the fact. And he's getting really salty about people making fun of him. He's like, oh, would you rather uh, Jeffrey sought out the company of ladies in the red light district of the Kingdom of Ted? Is that a satisfactory solution to your problem? Oh my god, dude. What, what was his thing with fucking Geoff Jeffrey. I, I don't know. Again, Jeffrey. people say people say it's like, oh, he's a self insert. It's not like uh, literally like it's not that simple. But again, it's like he's a, it's his character. He wants his character to be cooler and better than Sonic or whatever. I guess and it's like, again. There are states where a U.S. a thirteen year old can marry someone in their forties, as repugnant as that reality is. Sixteen. Oh my. Sally was sixteen as Jeffrey's <laughs> twenty. And again, I don't see a problem giving the relationship in royal history. Again, the ages aren't a hundred percent clear. Uh, it really does seem like Jeffrey's a bit older than that, but, you know, let's just say he's the author, he has to decide. He's deciding that it's 16 and 20. You know, not helping things is, like, his new, like, more human-looking design of him just, like, right. looks so fucking creepy. Like, Well, luckily, he, he was aware that people didn't like his response to this, so he went out and said, for the record, so I don't have to deal with any questions later on, Laura Sue is 16, she's already had sex, and there's no labels as bi or gay among her people because someone's sex is irrelevant to everything but procreation. Hashtag Ken Ally. Damn, he is an ally, you know? He, he abolished sexuality. Really? Exactly. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. Again, I'm I'm not an artist, so I never feel that comfortable like shitting on someone's uh you know artistic output. But like, here's some sketches he did at like a Comic Con recently, and they just have sort of a of Sonic. weird yeah. Vibe. The weird thing is like he can still do some. He's not. He, I will still say he's not a bad artist. Like blanket statement because he can still draw some pretty good stuff you know again he's usually better at human characters but it's not a hundred percent thing there's one in particular this one really became a bit of a meme on twitter is this fucking sonic face yeah it's so deformed because he tries it, to do it's like the so, road brow thing it's something about it yeah it's like too detailed right like i don't know how to explain it but it's like and then his little legs like i don't know and his weird hands he has like human teeth and gums the uh the perspective is just fucked his like it's really odd it's so the, the, the way it's shaded. It's so like stark. It's like, but it's like that's it's not something how, kind of weirdly it, haunting it about it. Yeah, it's supposed to be hair. Why is it shaded like that? <laughs> 
Now, I just want to say I'm oh, not yeah. accusing Ken of anything, but like, so he, he one of the th- sketches he drew was this pretty decent looking shadow from, uh, I, I don't know, someone requested it or whatever. But um, again, wow, this, this it does, it does really look good. awfully similar this to this though. key art from <laughs> Sonic X. So again, if maybe it's just a reference, I'm, I'm not a, I'm no artist here. Oh yeah, another weird uh, controversy he got into was he showed off the cover to one of his, uh, you know, Lara Sue. It was one of his Lara Sue covers. And people were like, hey, this is like just a redo of the, uh, there was an official Archie that had a very, very similar cover. And again, it's one thing to use a, you know, similar cover, but he is, essentially people are like looking like, well, the body shapes yeah, and some of these characters are like the straight up exactly the same, like traced over. And he's like... Well, like, okay, there are elements that are not the same, but like, yeah. I mean, with, with like Lara Sue. Yeah, not Knuckles, but the the other two characters coming out of the portal, particularly on the right. There's a there's a lot of overlap there. Is all. Didn't didn't the guy who owned the walrus try to get that character back, or is that right. I'm thinking of something else? Yeah, there, I was gonna say there's a whole weird thing going on over here where it's like. Um, <laughs> I just noticed in the in the new version, he still has like fucking. <laughs> <laughs> the anthony gosh. mackie face yeah and it, yeah look how out of place to the realistic human that oh looks it makes gosh. all the animal characters look the, even more fucked up and weird by comparison it looks so strange right what the fuck is this dude but yeah there's just something kind of funny where he's like really knowledgeable about lots of other like comic book lawsuit things where he's like there's a famous case where they tried to you know they just changed daredevil's outfit and they're like oh you know we, we don't need to credit the original creator now because he's got a different thing but then he, and he's he's like uh you know just because one changed one clothes and calls himself something different doesn't make him a new character especially when the change of clothes happens in the sight of everyone else but it's like it is funny when you actually look at like the things he's <laughs> publicly posted he's like i'm the proud owner of the intellectual copyright for evil sonic and the reverse freedom fighter and Robo Robotnik, you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, they are technically different characters. Yeah, whatever, whatever gives him the most rights is just what it is. What the rule right. is. So I'm like, I'm gonna analyze something real quick. I have a suspicion about something. Okay, yeah, this is real. You know that image of Anthony Mackie where he's like, where they first called him out? Mm-hmm. It's the same. He used the exact same drawing for uh, the cover art. Like it's right. the exact same drawing. He just <laughs> removed the smile. That's really funny. Yeah, it looks the same. <laughs> which which makes me think that he traced it because if he could just draw it again, why wouldn't he just draw it again? Right. It is a uh, I don't know. Again, I'll let the artists in the audience judge. Yeah, I'll, they... <laughs> I'll, put, I'll put the comparison on screen. But it's like, but just just look at this. See, that's that's the one on the uh, the astronaut photo, and this is the one from the cover art. <laughs> it's the exact same it really is it's funny it's almost at that point why even change the mouth just just own it that you're using the same image well you see in this image he has to be a little sadder and in the other image he's flying through space joyously so <laughs> it's very different tones right we had to like face out his smile away well i uh i read a ton of old issues of the, like of the sonic comic and i read the entire knuckles comic for this as well as many many online discussions relating to penders i would say that by far the best place for ken penders related info comes from a, a tumblr blog called thanks ken penders run by bobby schroeder which is uh just a very good insight and, and she also has an extremely good article on Medium just about the weird themes and content that you can find in some of his stories during Archie Sonic. I highly recommend checking them out if you're just more interested in hearing about the weird places that Penders goes in the comic and uh, just a sort of overall look at his time and tenure on the Archie Sonic comic. And, um, you know, it's kind of annoying that this is still a thing that has to be said, but uh, just just for the record, nobody go out and, like, try to own Ken Penders on Twitter, please. Like, stop trying to get you know, try, try to make him mad by posting unfunny memes under every single one of his tweets. Just uh, leave him alone. I don't know why it's so hard for people to follow the old edict of look but don't touch. I mean, there's no point in getting in a debate with Ken Penders because you're not going to be the guy that just changes his mind about his whole career. You know what I mean? So it's just more fun to just watch and, you know, observe, observe and without interfering. So you'll you'll just kind of Don't look... argue with him. Just if you if you want to talk to him, ask like a genuine question. You'll probably right. get something funnier out of that than just just like being like you're an idiot and you don't own this character yeah some people might think i'm overreacting here but you can literally go under like a lot of ken penner's tweets and you'll just find people going your art sucks blah blah it's like dude sh- just shut up like well, come on seriously if you want to make fun of ken penders just be a grown-up and record an entire podcast about it <laughs> over the span of like a year <laughs> right 
seriously though some people have this like perception of ken penders as like this nefarious sonic the hedgehog franchise villain when that's uh not really the case he's just like some weird old boomer comic artist guy who you know really he's really into his own work and uh i don't know i like i i would be sad if he like announced i'm retiring i'm never gonna release laura sue chronicles i'm deleting my twitter goodbye so i I don't want to be responsible for a wave of harassment towards him now, um, I'm not really super knowledgeable about, like, comic history or whatever, like, you know, the golden or silver age of comic books creators, but uh, that was the age that Ken grew up during, so I appreciate the insight provided by Something Awful user Red Eye Flight from the Ken Penders Suck Zone for helping me sort of understand the true extent of the influence that Jack Kirby had on his life, and um, he was a creator that Ken really looked up to and took inspiration from. I believe I have a tweet here where he's talking about how first comic he ever read was uh, by Jack Kirby and it sort of sparked a lifelong interest in uh, and it made him always keep an eye out for it. It's interesting sort of parallel here. The reason I bring it up is because Jack Kirby felt that Marvel had screwed him over in terms of creator rights after creating some of their most famous characters like you know, the X-Men, Thor, Iron Man, the Hulk, Fantastic Four. And in 1970, he actually left Marvel to go work for their rival company, DC. And uh, there was, ended up being a whole thing where his the heirs to his estate were sued over the rights to his characters uh, in 2009. And it was actually kind of right before all of Ken's legal crusades, as a matter of fact, and he believes it was a similar situation, not too dissimilar from his own, you know. Interesting. Well, did they win? Or did Jack Kirby's estate win? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure the exact settlement that they came to. I believe it was just some sort of out-of-court settlement. Let me just double-check on that. Yeah, they, they uh, it's actually interesting. It's, it's not really like, they don't really want cases of creator rights being brought to court like that. Because, um, you know, a lot of old school creatives like Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster would spend their entire lives struggling to retain any, like, right or any of their, like, the rights to their creative works and characters. And, you know, like, Bill Finger was a co-creator of Batman and he, like, died in poverty and obscurity. I think it would be better in general if creator if creatives and creators, like, got to keep and retain the rights to their characters, you know? Like, it's just, unfortunately, we don't really live in that world. Like, comic book creators are just notoriously unpaid and exploited. So, I, you know, I have been coming down pretty hard on Penders for a lot of this. But I do want to make it clear, I am on the side of, you know, creators getting the rights to their characters. And I still think it is kind of hilarious how he managed to beat Archie in a lawsuit. But, you know, partially, mainly because of Archie's own incompetence, but (laughs) nevertheless. Remember, kids, Penders still did something Jack Kirby didn't. (laughs) In the end. Yeah. He's he's surpassed his hero. He got the rights to his damn characters, which again, I just sort of explained that earlier, which is just like the odds of that happening were so low, which is like, you know, it's part of me. There's just, you can't really blame Ken Penders for wanting to, you know, be feeling so defensive over what he saw as his life's work and whatnot. So even if you, if it's your opinion that his life's work sucks, that's, that's up to you. But, uh, you know, all I can say is I'm definitely going to read the Lara Sue Chronicles when it comes out and you better (laughs) read it too. I think, yeah, I think everyone should go out and buy his NFTs when they come out (laughs) too. (laughs) but um no it it is very it's very true you know in spite of everything ken penders still won in a way that is very admirable right like on the level of artist rights especially if it's true that like he wasn't lying about what was in the contracts but right yeah like i said there was a lot of this stuff where i was like well i just i just wanted to present what he said and sort of present what happened and i'll I'll let you infer how much truth he's been telling it's i'm not here to call him a liar or anything like that but um is this the is this the end or are there still things that you have this is mostly the end i was gonna say i was just gonna briefly say you know since between the first part and the second part like you know the sonic movie the second movie came out and uh you know, there was a part with like Knuckles having, you know, a father and people were initially like, oh my God, is this going to be cause for Penders to sue? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But people thought, oh, is there rumblings that going to be a lawsuit? No, there wasn't nothing. None of that actually panned out. Although they did announce a Knuckles TV show. And I'm wondering, like, is someone on staff there? They have to have someone on staff be like, whatever you do. Do not put a, a race of technologically like in echidnas and have like a girl echidna that defects from that and joins them because because then we'll get sued. You know they have to have like a Pender's guy on staff to make sure that nothing they do is too similar to anything that happens in Lara Sue Chronicles. I imagine they need to bring him on like the the Mandalorian had Lucas. That's what that would be should. hilarious. Honestly, the funniest thing is like it's. I mean that's probably not gonna happen, but like Stranger Things have happened. Like I could easily him see him being like, hey, I'm a Knuckles expert. If he didn't have so much bad blood with like Sega from that lawsuit, you know, and he. He was just some weird guy. He wasn't actively taunting them. Right, yeah. (laughs) Cheering Um, them at every moment. Right. So, yeah, that is more or less everything to to talk about. I have one thing that I think you should... I don't know if you have notes for, but uh-huh. I, I, I think that was brought up last time. You, do you remember the, the Asian fan that, like, 
he was tweeting about. Oh, right. Okay, so this wasn't on the pod. This was like after we recorded it. I was sending you this. Okay, yes. This is one of, this is one of the things that I, I am really happy that we did not. Okay, I'm not super happy the first <laughs> But I'm happy because that happened right after. And it's like one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen him do. There was uh, not not even drama, just an f- interesting thing that happened. And, and Penner's always making interesting tweets. I don't know how to put him. So let's just say he says, I know it's going to cost me the Chinese market, but I can't throw the fan from Taiwan, middle pictured with her two sisters, under the bus uh, when she was the first one to ask what Laura Sue looked like when she heard I was working on Knuckles 20 years later. And then like- so... It's, it's just well, kind of a well, firstly, like, what weird what, thing to be what, like, I know that I'm going to look this just this tweet is going to cost me the Chinese market. <laughs> like, what does this mean? <laughs> I, I, I think it's some sort of like, I don't like China virtue signaling type post or something. I'm really not 100% sure what his exact intention was. I Again, I don't think Penders does a lot of stuff out of pure maliciousness. He's just sort of a kind of a clueless old guy a lot of the time. So anyways, I believe the person says, quote, quote, treats us and says, okay, I came back just to clear up a few things here. I'm Filipino American. During two of my high school years, uh, when I was active at the KPMB, I live in Taiwan due to my dad's job. I'm not Taiwanese, nor do I recall saying as such to Penders. He misinterpreted my two-year <laughs> stay for my ethnicity. Even if I was Taiwanese, I personally would not be okay with a guy posting a picture of me and my two sisters back when we were kids just to show off that he has international fans. Just posting the photo itself is already creepy as hell. I haven't been a fan of Penders or his works for years. And I don't approve of being this and being misinterpreted in any way at all. I reported the tweet because I wanted it taken down, but I'm not sure if Twitter would do it. I can't even explain the part that it's me in the photo, but we'll see. So it's just like, I don't know. He's constantly doing things to piss off people. <laughs> yeah, there's not taken down, obviously. <laughs> um, Yeah. Honestly, it's just a strange, uh... The, the, the end of this did sort of devolve into me just picking at weird, funny tweets that he made, but I didn't want it to be just too, like, meticulously going over... I didn't want it to just be a well, Pender's I, cringe compilation of just his bad just tweets in the end. the absurdity of it, because it's like, it's not like he's in the photo. It, to describe to the viewers, it's literally, like, this old photo of just three random, like, kids that he met at a convention, and then it's, it's like, clearly dated in from... Like, it's clearly dated from 2001, so... <laughs> <laughs> Again, there is also something just hilarious to me. It's like, I know this is going to cost me the Chinese market, but like, like I, 20 I years met- ago, I'd, I'd someone from Taiwan <laughs> asked me a question about one of my books. <laughs> like, what? what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> I, I don't and know. And he never deleted it. I don't even know if he saw this tweet because that, that wasn't a quote tweet. They, uh, they took a screenshot. Right, of right. His original. All right. Well, I think I think that's everything. Yeah, I was kind of hoping to end it more on that poetic Kirby, Jack Kirby <laughs> parallel note. But if we can just have a cringe moment we at can, the end, that's fine too. Or you can shuffle it out. It out. It's up to you. Yeah. No, I don't have to cut it out. It's fine. Yeah, we can cut it, flip, flip it around. I, flip it around. I was surprised. This can also be cut up. I was surprised uh, Penders never said anything about the knuckle stuff. I swear, I, th- I thought he did. Um, he, he never did anything like, he may have made like a coy like oh knuckles like look at this but he mostly honestly whenever people like acknowledge that he worked on the stuff he's more like he's just happy to be recognized and he is you he's know litigious yeah so yeah that mostly covers everything we wanted to say about penders maybe we'll do a follow-up episode at some point if there's reason to but for now that at least should give you an overview it's kind of a long overview but it is nevertheless an overview and uh in the future we'll try not to accidentally take nine month breaks without even telling anyone yeah Look, you just, you need to get faster at using the restroom, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't it's know on what me. you're doing in there. It's a long break. <laughs> but no, it was, it's an interesting story. I think it was, I think. It's just an interesting case study of a creator who's, uh, you know, still around, still adapting a life on the internet. A lot of people's exposure to Penders, you know, they, they read the comics as a kid and they haven't thought about it since. And maybe they'll watch one video and be like, oh, that Penders got into some wacky hijinks, didn't he? Some weird situations. But uh, I don't know. You can find a lot of videos just talking about the lawsuit or a lot of videos just talking about cringe moments from the comic. But like, I, I don't know. I wanted to do a slightly more extensive, like, you know, character study (laughs) whatever you want to call it no definitely i mean it was really interesting learning about like his actual kind of comics before sonic just his what what he was more passionate about and you kind of you kind of do feel it in in like a lot of what he's doing now where it it does feel like he he wants to do something more original and something a lot more unique and different from what he's been allowed to but Mm -hmm. he's restrained by what gets the eyes and what gets attention Right. And uh, I don't know, he's just sort of chugging away at his own little, again, I don't want to say it's just a passion project, because he is clearly like, you know, taking it very seriously. But, uh, you know, we'll see. I, I feel like at least, you know, it'll get some attention when it finally comes out just from, you know, Sonic fans that's, being interested. That's going to be a legendary moment. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, that's why I said maybe we'll have another Penders episode someday is, uh, you know, if there's ever more to talk about. Well, I think that I think that's it. I don't know how to, how to I forgot how we end. Yeah, I forgot how to end it. I forgot how to start it. Guys, we forgot um, how to be podcasters. We were not, we never, yeah. we, were, we did two episodes. We weren't even like pro seasoned professionals. So cut us some slack. Thank you for tuning in. We will try to not take as long for in the future. Thank you for being understanding. And if you aren't understanding, then fuck you. Yeah, go fuck yourself.